Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of By The Numbers. I am your host Richard Lewis. Joining me live from New York, it is Duncan Thorin Shield. And of course, just a reminder that this podcast is brought to you in association with Rivalry.gg. Go to Rivalry.gg slash RLS to qualify for up to $350 of special bonuses for people that support the channel. This is going to be the first episode of By The Numbers since the major. Honestly though, Duncan, I saw your video I believe, what was it called? Why this major sucked, <laughs> yo, or something. Something like that, yeah. Yeah, it's a pr- pretty sophisticated title, <laughs> direct on a point. Um, suspiciously I'm red eyes. to the ute, you know, yeah, for I the streets. Tell, a lot of my stuff's for the streets, which, you know, might go over your head living in your fucking gated community, but <laughs> there's a lot of mans out there living in the struggle, and I'm just trying to reach them. I know. can tell you were trying to reach the, the ute after having a zoo, mate, in that video. It was pretty good. Yeah. I thought, I could tell, oh, he looks like he's just woke up. I'm like... You do know where he lives. <laughs> Definitely not tired. Enough. Listen, um, my eyes did look pretty. Those bags were fully packed. Don't worry. <laughs> so look, man. Um, I don't want to rehash everything we said before. Uh, but but uh, you know, I think for just for the purposes, maybe people watch this podcast but don't watch your videos, sure. right? So um, I, th- I thought we'll give a very brief summary yes. of why the major was absolute fucking garbage uh, on here, and. Listen, you know, I I don't want to bang on about it, but I mean, I just didn't tick any of the boxes I wanted from a major. Now, what I thought was interesting was it had the potential to to, to be different and still tick the boxes. Actually, if Face It had put a bit more planning into it, from what I could tell, I mean, it seems to be a complete lack of planning and foresight on their part. It could have been the great community celebration we've always wanted majors to be. And it could have have been a more community-focused event and still been a great major, in my opinion. And I think Face It would have been perfect for that kind of, uh, how shall we say, you know, deliverable, right? So, uh, but but they just didn't seem to, they didn't commit to all being about the community. They didn't seem to to commit to being all about the excellence. And again, what you got was a tonal mess, like a fucking really bad movie that, you know, one moment it's a comedy, the next minute it's a drama. You can't really follow what's going on. You don't know how to engage with it emotionally. I think the point that really stood out to me was, you know, you've got this epic fight. Like, this is Astralis potentially entering in the fucking history books as one of the all, all-time sure. great teams. It's simple potentially entering as one of the all-time great players. Are some of these Navi veterans going to get their major finally? Lots of questions to be asked. Yeah. And it's like you said, halfway through the game, we're doing a, we're doing a funny bit with parlor, are we? And it's like, I think... You know, that, that that that's great week one, week two even, if you want to make it a community event. But then you pose as being the World Series of Counter-Strike, the World Championships of Counter-Strike, and you run these, like, serious documentaries. It's like they just didn't know what they wanted to be. And, and it, it's very much a face-it problem, as I see it. They try to be all things to all men and and actually end up achieving greatness in virtually no uh, area. Yeah, I, to me, that's probably the best way to summarize the issues that they had in terms of theme with this major is that Face It only has like one gear. And that gear is like, oh, you know, it's a fun vibe. We're like a bit different, We're doing a bit of comedy here, you know. Like, yeah, let's have some good games, but let's have some fun too. And that works for ECS. And that works for when they do in the past the Face It events before, because much like we've discussed this on the show before, much like DreamHack, it was a clever way to pivot when you didn't have the budget to be ESL. Exactly. To be like, right, well, if ESL presents themselves, so remember ESL's whole thing was like, we're the industry leader. So theirs was like, well, we're the cool event, you know, we're the event that's fun and laid back. And as I've told you, when I actually did one of those first face it it was face it stage one i think it was called was the one where that's literally what bardolf told me he told me just go ham just get, do any banter you want yeah. make it fun just keep the light but the problem is like that doesn't make sense for a major like a major is just not about that you know like i'm sorry you can't have the super bowl and have it just be all upbeat and like ah, ah, hey imagine it's a lot it. of fun you know just imagine, just imagine it. you know they're going the other way like sometimes i have to say i have friends who aren't that into sports and because they don't have anything like that filling that role in their life some of them if you watch like the champions league and they see that fucking intro like the they're like this is a bit over the top isn't it? i go yeah. i know what you mean but it is actually it does make it more hype when you watch the game you know you wanted to believe it's like some historic battle that's going down even though it's just a football game but the other thing is as well when i thought about this that's the other area i feel like face it messed up in is that they took the ecs concept and tried to just transpose it to the major and so another area where i think some of their problems came in is people forget i always mention this ecs events aren't marathons they're like three or four days they're 
very sm- short, like very concise format. You know, they don't have a lot of games. They've I've never actually seen ECS do an event like ESL Cologne. You know, where you blow out all the stops. It's like you're going for the biggest event possible, whole week long, build up, build up. Like they've never done it before. So actually, yeah, well, jumping up from ECS finals, to a mid is a big deal. Yeah, the ECS finals was kind of like that, right? I mean, there's a video um on youtube somewhere where someone's like compiled all the mistakes you were there for oh, it okay. you know um it was it, it's called like face it uh, you know greatest production yeah the ever. one from season three where they had all the tech yeah problems. yeah yeah and true. it's just you going and now we're gonna cut to a video yeah. no we're not i styled uh, it out i got yeah. i saved their ass on some of that because yeah they kept yeah. doing that like this is yeah. the segment right where for a joke again to keep it a different vibe yeah. they had me be the host instead of machine and obviously i've only been a host like you know i think that one event with fifth or something yeah. but I've hosted a lot of podcasts, so I can roll with it when there's like minor yeah, issues. So I even said to them, listen, don't worry, just cue me in on whatever you want. And then, you know, I was doing a setup pretty like, you know, oh well, we'll see how they do in this particular video then. Right, not doing that then. So over and it, it, it must have happened, no joke, in my one segment about three or four times. It was no, it wild. literally does. If you if you watch the, if you watch the YouTube video. <laughs> and I only did I mean, one game like that as well. <laughs> no, no, there's there's a lot of difference, I think. Um if you're going out live to a crowd and that's happening, or if you're on a couch and it's happening, and this is what I mean, like for me, ECS, the the one they did in Mexico, uh, in Cancun, that event is that's their peak. That that's everything face it should be. That's an incredible technical achievement to go to Mexico, you know, this holiday resort, run a fucking big LAN event, amazing games, great vibe on the on the uh, talent. Um, you know, with being on the couch, very much like a summit broadcast almost, but with this backdrop of the games are actually amazing and meaningful. But on top of that, they also produced very great thematic content, I thought. Like, here we are at a holiday resort. It's a holiday resort event. Here's some holiday type shit, you know? And it's like, all of that worked. Uh, and and you, I just think sometimes the step up creatively to know what is required of a major is big. And, and I honestly think Face It was so enamored with the idea of getting the major for so long they never actually thought what the fuck are we going to do when yes. we get it and what you got was a bunch of half our shit you know it's like, like this yes. reminds me of the overwatch league right where when yes. i heard the overwatch league premise announced i kept saying to monty like it's not even just that they haven't announced how they're going to do this they're describing a league that has never existed in any form or sport. Because remember, they want a global league that simultaneously is one league and yet takes place in the entire world geolocated with all the franchise. I said that's never been done. So yeah. my first question is, do you even have a plan? Or are you coming up with it like on the seat of your pants, you know, like just figuring it out as you go? And yeah, it sounds similar in this sense. Because when you hear that big like, oh, the, Valve, you know, considers all the proposals... Who knows what that even means? Or that might just mean, well, I'd have it in Wembley, uh, it'd be in the UK, and you know, it'd be a big event. Like you know, who knows how much of the actual logistics they are able to pin down? Uh, some of it maybe you won't even start figuring out yourself once you get accepted. So I do feel like that's one area where, when you consider a few of the ones we've had now, Dream Occlusion of Poker, PGL Crackham, now this event, I hope Valve thinks a bit more carefully when they're looking at these proposals. Because the reason I get a bit bummed out is sometimes I'll hear what one of the other proposals was by one of the orgs that I'm more friendly with, you know, and they'll be like, oh, you know, we pitched them this sick event. And it would have been amazing. And it's like, you think, how did that get turned down for this other thing, you know? And so you know, no one knows where Valve's heads at on those. Yeah, well, I, I, I can probably give a little bit of insight. Again, I never claim to speak on behalf of Valve. What you've got to remember is, first of all, uh, and this is no secret, uh, the Counter Strike team at Valve is is obviously not big. It, you know, as compared to some of their other projects that they're working on. Uh, this is why I've never understood why people go out publicly and attack the CS:GO devs. You know, or, or like for example, re- there's this because we've had a major so close to the international. There's this furor again from esports writers and in particular Counter Strike enthusiasts about we need a TI in Dota you 2. Right? You'll never see me on that, Rich. You'll never no. see me on that. T- no, I know. For me, like, I feel like they've just missed the plot there, which is like, we get two TIs if you do it right. Yeah. Just fix the current pages we have. We have a better system. Yeah, exactly. All we need is the fucking format. Yeah. <laughs> We All we need better, is a better format crowd, and, and a, better a bit more razzle dazzle. We'll be killing it, mate. Yeah. Because I tell you what, I hate in those games like League of Legends with their World Championship, Dota with TI, where it doesn't matter what happens in the rest of the year. People just make it like that one tournament's everything. Yeah. So, you know, I never understood why people attack the CSGO devs. And equally as well, I mean, if you go back, I want to say 2016, 
<clears throat> there was these um there was there was a moment where it was reported we were going to get a ti and yeah, i think there a, was some sort of a leak like yeah that, and, right? and, and i and i think a valve staff member came out and said yeah we'd love to do something like ti for csgo and then immediately another valve employee came out and said no nope, there will not be a ti for csgo because we do, you know we don't think we need it we don't want to copy what dota do we've got our own ideas and our own environment and obviously what you got to remember is when anyone speaks from valve they cannot speak for valve they can only speak for, apart from Gabe Newell, obviously, uh, because of this flat system that Valve has. So some people have some ideas. Some people have some other ideas. I'm sure if we got all the fucking CSGO dev team, you know, all five or six of them or whatever it is, I mean, like the ones yeah. who have actual, you know, input into the project, and we sat them all down and said, hey, would you like something like TI for CS? They'd all go yes. But the reality is how do you then take the resources from within Valve? and make it happen sure. you can't because you know gabe newell's jam is dota 2 everyone below him loves dota 2 and will also go the extra mile with dota 2 because it's gabe newell's jam and he's the only guy you could sort of call a de facto boss at valve everyone else has to argue and fight and plant their flag it's a, you can go read up about it if, uh, if you listen to the podcast now and you don't know what i'm talking about but um you know th this whole pushback against you know the, the dev team uh, seems very strange to me. We only have it as good as we've got because of that handful of people within Valve. And if you start pushing them away and start making them feel uncomfortable, things are only going to get worse. And we need to kind of work with them and, and, and kind of uh, be a bit more friendly with them. Now, that being said, obviously, I've pitched for a few majors myself. I've been involved in more than a few majors down the years. And I know that pretty much what Valve want to do is geographical diversity is a big uh, paramount you know, thing, but they really also do rate production value. And in that regard, I don't think you're going to see face again another major. That's probably one of the weirdest parts, right? Because if anything, yeah, probably just again. as a tournament organizer, if you were doing top trumps of tournament organizers, face it's got to probably be the worst for production value as far as I can consider. Yeah, sure. Because I know people are going to bag on PGL here. PGL runs a way smaller crew of people than I've ever seen any fucking massive tournament organizer. So when they have a few slip ups, I understand why it's because one and guy might also be doing two people's innovative. job or something. And they've, yeah, also, they've also been really, tried really, to really do innovative. Some new shit, yeah. Yeah. So. So, I mean, you know, basically what happens is Valve are willing to take a risk w when it comes to production value. They much prefer to have, like, big companies. But, but, but the rationale is we can't just give it to the people who deliver constant quality. And I know that probably sounds like a little bit frustrating, yeah. right? But, but, but imagine a world where ESL only handle the majors or E-League only handle the majors. It creates its own sense of problems. So I respect Valve going with, with Face It on the basis that, you know, it's London. It's another great city in the world. Um, but but ultimately, I, I don't think Face it will get a chance again off the basis of this. Here's the other thing you got to factor in, and this is <coughs> this is kind of where I, I will be massively sympathetic to, to Face it. There is no money in in hosting a major. This oh. is what TOs will never say publicly because they don't want to upset anybody. Let me tell you firsthand: you don't make your money on the major. What happens is Valve come in, they say, "Here's the prize pool," but that here's all these other right. What to get the major? The pitch you have to put out has to be so good that you've then got to follow through on it and deliver all of those great fucking things. And Valve will give you the prize money, but they don't give you any money towards that stuff. I mean, um, they didn't even produce their own player uh, biographies this time yeah. around. And, and I don't think they have done for the last two or three majors. Um, so now that's on you. And it has to be Valve quality, but you'll face it. And you don't have Valve money, nowhere near it. So you don't make money on the majors. And you've got to deliver all of this stuff with a dwindling budget and all these problems start coming up. You know, like week one, you, you have an internet problem, so you need to create a contingency. Week two, you have to do this. Then there was the thing with the talent where they tried to scrimp and save. And people like me and you complained about it, saying it's a fucking major. You know, E-League did that too, um, where we had less talent than probably we needed for the broadcast. And you pointed that out, and I had to remain fucking stum because I'm a whipped little bitch like sure. that. Uh, you know, corporate rich lasted two years. It was fun, wasn't it? Um, but you know, that's the fucking reality. That like you've got to cut some corners somewhere. And I just think Face it quickly realized, holy shit, we've cut so many fucking corners. We're left with a fucking circle. So an I, egg, I, yeah, or an egg. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I do yeah. feel fucking sorry for them in that regard. And um, this is what I mean. Like, if Valve could get better CS:GO events if they would just lift the cap on the pri uh, on the crowdfunding. If, yeah. if 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 they would just say. 
Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna get. We're gonna. We're gonna. It's weird have, you don't just give it a go once, you know, isn't it? Yeah. Like why? Why not? Why not just see how high we can get it? It was great for Ti, and you kind of feel that that number is starting to plateau now. That it's never going to be this constantly climbing thing. There is only a finite amount of Dota players and people willing to put money into a compendium um, to have this great event like Ti. But why not just lift the cap once and just see what it's like, and maybe do like a slight little revenue share just to kickstart things? Because Tos and Counter Strike are hurting in general in terms of the finances i saw a fucking tweet uh from carmack just the other day and Silvio from pgl's in there and and lurpus is in there and i think you know i got tagged in it for some reason um because they were saying you know we've not talked about the fine the, the financial particulars of being a to i think we have me and you i think actually out of all the journalists in the scene we probably talked about it yeah. to to death but but the reality is that th- without broadcasting rights deals which is why we always backed the idea of Facebook, even yeah. though the delivery was bad. We all agree that, right? And even though the way ESL handled rival streams was bad, the the idea is not only just a good idea, it's an essential part now. If you don't want pay-per-view, broadcasting right to how you offset pay-per-view. Otherwise, what's being piloted now at the Overwatch League Right where it's like, oh, you pay to get all these little extras, and you have to have a sub, and you pay this, and you pay that. Eventually, it's going to be you pay that to see the games. So you have to make a decision here, and and I and I do feel sorry for tos, and especially tos that get the major because honestly, it can be a bit of a poison chalice. If you yes. do a great major, everyone says you know high five, great job, but ultimately, you you only get a a very small amount of currency coming out of that unless you're like you know MLG and you do the fucking Elvis and die on the toilet, and everyone remembers you fondly, right? Or, you know, you you do a bad job, you do a poor job, and it really harms your reputation, and you made no fucking money off it. And face it, are, are in that latter category. They've been absolutely fucked by a system that makes it incredibly hard. Like, you all want the prestige of doing the major, but the rewards for doing one, actually, the sad reality is, it's not all that. You get a little bit of kudos if you do a good job. So I will uh, say though, that's the bizarre part of it in this particular instance, though, is I I like I try to think if I was in their position, how would I think this was ever gonna work out? Like mm-hmm. with the with the what they actually put forwards, with the plans that they seemingly had, with what they were able to execute, how did they ever think that was gonna be like you know, fucking applauded and get all the acclaim and it was going to be wicked. Like, they must have just been, if not delusional, just crazily enthusiastic and optimistic about the what, what they were doing. Yeah, and, there's, and look, and there's a question in the chat saying, why would anyone bid for a major if you don't win? Well, obviously, you see, if you do a good job, the prestige of doing that good job does spill over into other areas. Of course. You know, Ely gets to dine out. I mean, like, and again, you know, I get to dine out. I hosted the most watched, uh, you know, t- Twitch channel, and and E League ran this Boston event. That's really, really good. And then what happens is that goes into your deck for the next event. So anybody yeah. who was anybody who was on the fence about allowing you to produce something for their game will now look what we did for Counter Strike over here with the major, and they go, oh, oh, holy shit, we'd love an event like that for our fucking game. So that the wins do not come endemic to the CS community. The wins are actually for the business when you step outside the CS. That's the win that you get to go to a developer who's maybe never had an esports tournament, or you get to go to like an Epic Games, you know, or, or, or a Blue Hole, uh, you know, corporation and say, listen, we can run an event as good as this for your game, but then you've got margins in that game, you know, and that, and this is how it all works. It's all interlinked. So, um, it, you know, like I say, I, I, I do feel a little bit sorry for Face It, but again, this is what happens. If you're so worried about thrashing the pants off ESL, you take your eye off the fucking ball about what you're meant to do, and that is just to do a good job and serve the community as best as you can and deliver as good a product as you can. And unfortunately, I don't even think it's up for debate. I, I think the community, like, that was the worst major. I, I, I don't think I've seen anything to the contrary. Yeah. Like, so. a pretty way, normally when you have people going ham one way, there's, like, the counter circle trick. There isn't even one. Yeah. There, no. there isn't one. Man. The best case scenario is the people who are still sort of like, oh, but it's not all face its fault. Okay, you know what? I'm with you on that one. Not all of it is face its fault. But the ultimate end result sucked. It doesn't matter whose fault it is. Yeah. It sucked. So if some of, by the way, if some of that is on Valve, like, for example, if Valve did demand that that build be used and you couldn't roll it back, then, yeah, Valve fucked it up. But you know what? Valve fucked it up for face it then. So, you know, I can't, that still doesn't change the viewing experience, which is this isn't as good as it should be. Yeah, and, and also just to add, and then we'll move on, start talking about some of the um, roster madness. 
But, uh, you know, just imagine all the things that are out there control. First of all, I think we're all agreed. Let's never have a major after a player break again. Let's just never do that. Like, ever. Because I will say I do sympathise with TOs on that one, though, because I, yeah. I'm trying to think if it was ESL, someone from ESL saying this, or someone from DreamHack. But someone said something like that last time, maybe it was Scoots and Lopez talking to each other, said, mm. said something like the last time players were asked about the, the topic of a break, like half of them wanted the break to come right before the major or something mad like that. And I will say yeah, sure. players yeah. are feckless as fuck. Like, remember, it was the players that wanted ESL to switch to that round robin best of one system that as soon as they implemented, we saw a million good teams not make playoffs, etc. And then all the players be going, who the bloody hell suggested this? Can we go back to that GS? I've always preferred GSL. It's like where you couldn't find one of the cunts who said that that's what they wanted, but that's what they all voted for. So they are, yeah. don't worry, players are mad two-faced like that. No, I've, I've said this as well. Like, <laughs> l- listen, if you think players know what's best for players, a lot of the time they fucking don't, which is why it took so long get a players union up yes. and running and it's why the players union initially when it first came together back when ppd from dota 2 was trying to help them he was having to explain to them like you mustn't uh you mustn't b- blow your fucking beans on dumb shit like you know demanding you know five-star hotels or business class flights and shit like that. you must pick and choose your battles you know and cs players didn't really understand it and and all they really grasp still, I think, to to a broader degree, which is why I'm glad Scoots is involved, is this idea of fucking Twitter leverage, and it's 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 stupid. Um, but yeah, you know, look, here's how it should work: you should have a season. There should be a few little gaps in the season. We should fucking just abolish online leagues for tier one teams, uh, and then boom, you should have a major and then a player break. And that's just how it should work. And that's how it works in sports. The idea of like, again, hey, everyone, uh, we're in the middle of the NFL season. We're just going to go take a fucking holiday for four fucking weeks and then come back and play the Super Bowl. Is that all right with everybody? It's like fucking hell. Imagine the standard of football you'd get. Have you ever watched a preseason game? It's a fucking disgrace. So that shouldn't have happened. I feel sorry that face. It had to be the kind of like canary in the fucking coal mine, the test case to prove that. So, so that was that was unfortunate for them as well. And then, and I just wanted to bring this up, um, you know, because everyone, oh, you're always picking on the guy. We've only mentioned him a couple of times after this. I don't think we'll have to mention him again. But obviously, we've talked about, like, you know, Zeus is ex-translator um, guy and social media guy. He absolutely fucking um, f- just stuck the fucking final knife, you know, like Julius Caesar on the fucking steps. <laughs> that was almost like some mad setup, wasn't it? No. Well, let, let's. So for, for those that saw it, right, like he put out a tweet saying it's going to be a huge announcement for CS, you know, relevant to CS. He said um, it directly impacts yeah, directly CS impact Go. CS Go. That was his words. Yeah, and it's coming out. Well, here's, here's also the thing, though. I am sick of all these fucking CIS region clout chasers that don't know what the fuck they're talking about. I'm talking about Zeus, who fucking did that interview about, oh, there's a bloody fucking new FPS coming from right. They've been working on it for three fucking years, mate. It's not news. Valve know about it. They're making artifacts. That they're going to kill Hearthstone. That's 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 what they're focused on. They're going to just corner the fucking card game market and make a fuck ton of money on the Steam market. There is no fucking worry about a great FPS coming along. Well, that's why they didn't get triggered about fucking Overwatch or anything else. Valve know what's best for Valve. Um, the idea that some fucking in-game leader from fucking Ukraine has all this like mad insider information when everybody knows that like it's very difficult to get any leaks when it comes to Valve at all. And the idea he's the guy who has all the info. It's clickbait. He is Someone living... Who- by his own admission, is not fluent enough in English to use his own Twitter. <laughs> but he's right. just having all inside no. convos yeah. with Valve. Right? So that interview didn't help. And then, obviously, there was another one who got away with it. Sam, I don't know if you can um, Google this uh, for me uh, while, while we're talking. I, I don't know how your PC's performing today. But if um, if you can, it's on Cyber Gamer, And it is a manager from um, Navi. Cyber yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Cyber, CyberGamer.ru, and there's a there's a there's a manager um, from Navi who basically said we are getting the t- a, a TI announced. 
That's what he said. So he should have got it way fucking worse than the fish guy. I don't know. But just imagine you you work for Narvi, one of the biggest organizations in the world. You got money coming out your ass. It's you, You're doing it in the CIS region, so you can have all this extra shit on the side. No one can fucking hold you accountable for the shit you do. Hey, fucking why not run a gambling site, Zeus? No one cares about it, you know? So it's all fine. It's all fine. You've got money coming out your asshole, and you still need the Twitter cloud. And you're just out there straight lying to people. So... Uh, you know, that announcement didn't fucking help because everyone was like poised on the last day, like, you know, expecting fucking Gabe Newell to come and fucking walk out and fucking say, listen, guys, you're getting free artifact and we're going to, we're announcing, you know, and it was none of that. It was, yeah, we've got leagues now and face it, mate. We got leagues. And it's like, I feel sorry for face it because that's a very valid announcement to make at a face it event. I probably would have done it um, right at the start of the day because I don't think it was worth putting halfway through the fucking final four, but whatever. Um, but you know, now everyone was hyped up because of these little fucking dickheads that are just lying all Did the you time. You see the way though to get that, clicks. That Zeus's translator guy tried to play it off initially, like, "Well, I never said it was like a big." You literally said it was a big announcement and directly impact CS:GO. So yeah. you know, what I actually think I think he didn't properly know the announcement. I think he actually confused the the concept of them announcing something like a fucking franchise league with what they were going to announce in. I think he fucked it up. No, so that, basically, cause that, cause I, I can even you'd tell have you have to be chain. purely clickbaiting otherwise to yeah, get it. Right? No, I can even tell you the chain. Okay. So I think uh, Face It were talking about it with, with like, uh, you know, around some players. And then those players heard it. And then another player heard it. And it was literally a game of fucking telephone right down the line. You want to know, <laughs> Fish, I talked to him about it. Because, look, listen, I'll wreck him on Twitter. But he is just a kid at the end of the day who's out of his fucking depth. He's never going to be taken credible again. He knows that. He's very aware of that. He's very aware how bad he fucked up. He definitely didn't deserve any of the death threats and all of that fucking nonsense that came his way. But, you know... As I say all the time, when you seek attention, be careful because you might fucking You'll get, get attention, it. just not all the type you like. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You might not like it. Right? <coughs> um, but uh, but yeah, so he, he got it from the players, players, player who heard it from the player, who heard it from fucking face. Um, you know what I mean? And then the Navi guy got it from him and put it out there. Oh, it's going to be TI, TI for CSGO, but not TI for CSGO. Fuck me, guys. Can you, like, uh, can you just fucking hold on to your fucking draws for five fucking guys, minutes? Guys, Ja Rule told me that <laughs> CSGO is going to be an announcement coming time. Yeah, no, it's just ridiculous. It's like, literally, guys, like, I get it, right? Like, you know, it, maybe maybe you feel underappreciated or something. But, like, can we all just stop this Twitter clout chasing bullshit? Because you've really harmed the event on the last day there, just as it was fucking rallying. Right, and on top of that, now everyone thinks you're a bunch of cunts. That Narvi fucking guy skated like he's fucking made a Teflon, you know. But like, listen, and I'll say it to the community: shame on you if you upvoted that shit. Shame on you if you upvoted that to the front page and got all fucking excited. When are you gonna learn in the CS community? If it doesn't come from a credible journalist, take it with a liberal fucking pinch of salt, eh? You silly cunts. What's wrong with you all? How many times are you going to get fucking burned by people making shit up for attention and you upvote it to fucking Reddit and go, yeah, this is definitely coming. My favourite one. Who's that guy saying it, though? Never heard of him. Doesn't yeah. matter. It must be real. My like, favourite are the, like, ten utterly deranged people who just go around on every DK report. Like, well, most of the things he says are wrong anyway. And then they list two examples that, like, aren't even wrong, but they just didn't understand themselves. And they go, <laughs> see, they're just making it all up. And I could do it. It's absolutely ridiculous. So, I mean, you know, look, I, I felt sorry. I can't handle the synchronicities in life, Rich. <laughs> like, you know, when you go into hotel rooms, right, yeah. you get complimentary bottles of water, don't you? Yeah. It's well, true, obviously, yeah. it's free water. You're not looking at the brand. You go into water. I enjoy all the brands of water. Are you ready for this? This <laughs> is just on, fucked up, mate. The synchronicities <laughs> are running. There's someone being and purposely stashed into my room. It is an ESL event. Like, right. the brand that it is, I'll see if you can see this. Can you read that? The brand is called <laughs> Poland Spring. Like, first of all, Poland. When is when is ESL Katowice usually held? In March, spring. What is that? What the fuck is that? Mate, I'm telling you, man, you never came what back that? from that last fucking not... BMT trip, brother. Listen, you're, mate, you're, I... you're still tripping. You're on I a think promo. what happened was I was in a car crash <laughs> on the way to the airport to go to EMS One Katowice 2014, and this is all just my fever dream as I exit this fucking realm and go towards the light. <laughs> now I reckon, I reckon it's like fucking open your eyes, mate. Okay. You know, I reckon it's like that, you know, like go remade into Vanilla Sky. I'm the that's one making my that's life what's happening like to you. this. Yeah, yeah, it's all you, mate. <laughs> you're in control. <laughs> Um, so anyway, look, uh, you know, it, it's, 
it, the whole thing was just a fucking cluster fucking a mess. Let's talk about the games. Um, I guess we're <laughs> well, not, well I guess... Uh, let's 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 go move on in the better parts and talk about the fucking games. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's like it doesn't even save it, does it? But enough about the negatives. Yeah, now let's talk about all them. But you know shit what? Games. There were some bloody good games. No, nah, mate, that's the thing, man. This is what I mean about the, this is what I mean about the player break. Like the quality of CS for a fucking world championship was fucking straight garbage. I, I there was two Think games. Think about that as well, right? Right. Uh, this is the one area I do feel for Face It Rich, right? You fucked up the execution on everything. You fucked up the tone. You haven't nailed anything. You've even baited people with a stupid announcement that means nothing. <laughs> Valve's fucked you over with the build. They've given it after a player <laughs> break. All this. You go at the end, right? Tell you what, though. It's all people about the will game. remember the great yeah. matches. It's like you don't get any great matches in the playoffs. Well, right. not not even one. No, keep in not, mind, not uh, keep in mind, I streamed every game bar one. So, I, and, and I watched that in bed while thinking I can't get up and stream today, and then did. Um, so, I watched every game. I can't remember any of them, mate. I, I remember Team Liquid and Astralis and Astralis NIP, and obviously the final. I mean, even some of the semis are already fading. My brain's just saying, listen, mate, you've got limited space here. You don't need any of that shit. Yeah. But I can remember fucking MLG Columbus vividly. I can remember. You know, I yeah. can remember the Boston. That's major usually the main vividly. thing. That, that's why I even said when we were talking on a past episode, it's actually kind of unfair because the bizarre thing is, if if the games are good enough, you actually forget the bad things about the organization because that's yeah, the part course. that you won't yeah. retain. Like you're not going to remember three years later that you know the PCs were a bit dodgy on day one. You're going to remember if the semi final was some insane shit. Like remember the the infamous collusion of poker one where G two played yeah. Envious and it was like you know G two could have made it to the final and they were complete underdogs and Envious was the number one ranked team in the world. Like that's the shit you remember. And unfortunately, no one will actually remember any playoff games here. They'll just remember. I mean, I guess it's fitting thematically that Astralis just fucking steamrolled everyone and won without losing a map. So, and it's sad, man, because there's, there is some good fucking storylines and players sure. that emerged on scenes and teams that imploded before our eyes. But like contextually, like a year from now, we're not really going to remember how any of that happened. It's no. just going to be like some weird little fucking footnote. Oh, was it at that London major? Yeah, yeah, that was the one Astralis won, right? Yeah, they beat Navi in the final. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, you know, it, it, it's crazy. So, look, um, uh, we'll uh, talk about Astralis. I mean, I, I said this coming in, that sure, they look mortal on week one, but even looking mortal, they're still clearly, in terms of, um, you know, consistency, undoubtedly the best. Their thing. fucking C game might be the best that we've ever seen in Yeah, that's what I mean, that's right? That's not like, an exaggeration, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, and, and everything they do is just so fucking perfect. I mean, again... They were top of all the utility damage charts. They've got a mastery of smokes, flashes, nades, molotovs that very few fucking teams have. Incredible individual level of performances. So just a, a couple of things. First of all, I mean, we were always waiting for that sort of phase dynasty to come in. It didn't happen. Astralis somehow managed to kick back into gear, and now we're very much in an Astralis era. Uh, so the first question, I guess, is how, you know how long can it continue? How long you know are we going to end? Because I look at all the other teams around them; they're so inferior by comparison yes. that it almost does feel that like give bar, bar one or two upsets or Astralis not attending a tournament, it could get to a fucking stage of domination like the Fnatic of two thousand and fifteen. If we're yeah, not already in it, that's one of the problems that I actually see is even though I'm sure to some degree there's like a circular element and the fact that the other top teams all have like a fatal flaw or an area in the map pool they're not as good in probably contributes to Astralis looking flawless. But that's part of the issue is that Astralis doesn't really have any area that's logical you can sort of attack them in. Like, like they don't have a weakness that can be your strength and therefore give you an awesome matchup. So, for example, one of the few teams that did beat them, obviously, was Na'Vi when they beat them at ESL Cologne. But it's like I said at the time, you go back and look at that, they're winning on a map like Inferno that they themselves don't even win on that often. They're winning in part because, you know, this player's having one really good game. It's not like it's team-based issues. It's it's things that are by the by, and you can't replicate that every time. So I, I, I do think even if some of these other teams made the right roster move or fixed something in their map pool, I think people could compete with Astralis, but it's hard to see how anyone can displace them. So what I'd have to do instead is revert to history and say usually what happens is whoever the dominant team is, that little window opens up where you can get all those titles and you've got to get them all while you can. And then eventually 
for whatever reason, people make the right roster move, or your players themselves, someone starts to slump, you, you no longer are unbeatable. Like, for example, here's a really obvious thing that could switch things overnight, is some other team gets super good on Nuke. There we yeah. go. That yeah. would be an interesting wrinkle, because obviously they haven't lost on that, and if you go 18-0 and zero on a map, yeah, you can build a fucking dynasty off that. You'll win a few championships if you can win a map 100% of the time. So, okay, that will eventually get cracked. Someone will get some wins. Maybe, as a result, more people are willing to play them on it. Dust 2 is another one, you know. That's still a very up-in-the-air map. So there's a few ways it can happen, but I, I can't, I'm kind of with you. that the, the bit that's depressing is it doesn't feel like the team that's going to dethrone Astralis currently exists. No, like, even uh, if it's Na'Vi, it's Na'Vi with a roster move or something, you know. Like, like, think about it. I mean, we've had, like, North, like, MSL had to watch 150 demos and only prepare for Astralis and get Astralis twice at, at a tournament to win a tournament and is now out of the team by all accounts. <laughs> Obviously, MSL, uh, you know, like you say, man, fucking had to kick himself because uh, he gets that MVP award. He's, he's reinvented himself as an AWP, getting all the plaudits, and then he gets fucking usurped, right? So it's, it's pretty fucking crazy. Um, so anyway, you know, look, um, back to what the fuck we were talking about. It's about if anyone could beat Astralis. Yes. Yeah. Can anyone beat Astralis? I'm, I'm looking, I'm looking at the top 10, like, you know, may, you feel like maybe Team Liquid sh- could have done it, but then yes. they had their chance and fucked up. Uh, I don't think Na'Vi are good enough man for man. I- I'll stand by everything I said, you know, Edward and Zeus, thank fuck they didn't win the major. Um, MIBR seem to be very artificially high. Uh, Mouse sports have got problems. I think big aren't good enough. I mean, like really, as this new top ten has evolved, it's it's the weakest top ten we've had in a in a, in a good while. And um, yeah, I'm not uh, I'm not really fucking feeling it. You know, as as a as, a, as a, just like there's anybody there who can dethrone them. So I think the Astralis thing is is going to run on for a long, long time. Uh, the other point I wanted to make was I mean about- the obvious one to pick, I guess, because like I said, it's like to me the team that's going to beat them probably doesn't exist right now. The obvious yeah. people who could instantly make a change is Phase Clan because we know they've got the money and they've got sure. part of the pieces, you know. So I guess in theory, if they make a big, big power move over the next few months, I don't know what it would be. You have to give them the, the at least like a bit of leeway that they could do it, you know. Because they've already, in theory, they've already got the players to do it. It's just that at the moment, this composition doesn't work. Yeah, it definitely doesn't. Um, but they, so this is the next part of the Astralis equation. Obviously, lots of plaudits have been poured out onto um, Simple. All right, so we'll just say now, uh, Sam's having yeah, problems. Yeah, some area but... problems. So, yeah, uh... we we were just joking about like how um, there's an egg shaped EMP gone off over Cardiff, uh, deployed by Face It to stop the podcast. We get we moved away. They didn't do it quick enough. Uh, but anyway, so the other part I wanted to talk about with the whole Astralis thing was um, obviously everybody says oh, you know simple best player in the world. I'm inclined to agree with it, but I think there's got to be an argument for a different kind of appreciation, and that is obviously of device racked up another MVP yes. at this uh, major, is incredibly consistent, uh, is a very different kind of player to Simple, but is amazing in terms of production, the numbers, and never drops below a certain level of quality. You know, it always used to be said he went missing in big games, that he choked. But even then, if you go back and look at those chokes, he still had numbers that would be great for any other player. It was just his fucking device. So there's an argument now that people are putting out there, you know, kind of saying, oh, I don't know, because Simple did choke in the major final a little bit, didn't have a great performance himself. Um, is, is Device now the best player in the world? And, uh, you know, I, I don't know how I feel about it. I'd still say Simple. But I think there is a compelling argument for Device, at least. Yeah, the problem with that is, it's like, yeah, it just gets into the whole thing of, like, what does best mean? Like, if I had to describe it, because, okay, funnily enough, this didn't happen at the moment, but it could, in theory, have been the case that we had a similar story this year with Cold Zero. If MIBR, the core had remained one of the best teams, and Cold Zero was putting up all the same numbers he used to in the past years, it would have been a similar story. It's like, right, you've got this guy, Simple, who's just unbelievable, and in terms of, like, just in isolation, is the best, clearly, but then you've got a guy in Cold Zero whose team's very good, and then he'd have this consistent and stats and he always does his job so i feel like I, if you notice i've started to use the the terminology for people like device i just call him the most efficient player because yeah, to me I that perfectly it. describes his strength you know because the idea is and this is what's different about sort of like a simple type player is someone like device can also sort of like leave room for other people when it doesn't need to be him who carries the game 
You know what I mean? Like, and by the yeah, way, yeah, yeah. to be fair, that's a mad luxury to have. You got to have someone like fucking Magus, who isn't even up for all these MVP awards, but will put up MVP award numbers in some of the same events. You know, so they do have a lot of luxury in terms of the toolkit they've got working with Astralis. But I agree in terms of like playing their role to perfection. I don't think you can find anyone better than Device and Counter Strike at the moment. Simple. On the other hand, though, is also working with something of a flawed situation. You know, he couldn't do that. Like in his yeah. team, he has to pretty much be almost the best player almost every single game. And that's to give him a chance to go deep in tournaments. So, yeah, it's a tough one on that one because obviously one team's winning everything. The other guy can only win because of how good he is. So I, I'll agree. It's, a, it's a, one of those rare cases in history where I think it's just like personal preference. If someone said they thought mm. the device was the best, I can understand that logic too. Yeah, I think I can't remember which player it was uh, who tweeted out after the major. Do, do we do we remember who it was? Somebody said Astralis best team in the world, Device best player, some some pro player. <coughs> I can't remember who it was. I will say this because I made this mm. point actually on counterpoints once. Mm. Like, it, considering a lot of players have a lot of what we'd think of as the star players have a natural bias to very very aggressive players. Mm. Like their kind of player is like simple or Nico. You know these are the players they really respect. And if you ever watch any videos where people are listing who do you think the best player is, loads of you know the flushers of the world, they'll all say those names. But I tell you what's very interesting and telling as a distinction. You go and talk to any coach, and the coaches are insanely in love with Device as a player. Course. Like they think he is the perfect player. Like they even love exactly what the players will criticize. Like players will be like, yeah, but sometimes, you know, he plays a bit passive and then just saves too much and goes for exit kills. The coach has got like a fucking boner two foot long when he sees that. Like what? So he always saves the orb, never gives it up stupidly, like gets all the exit kills while not dying. Like that's their dream to have the orb on their team do that. So it is interesting how you can get that distinction between like a player's worldview and a coach's worldview. Yeah. Um, and I agree. I, I think, I think, like you say, I think it helps that device seems to be a coachable player as well. That is somebody who, when he was having the psychological problems, he talked to a sports psychologist. When he was having production problems, he went back and studied demos. Uh, this is somebody who obviously, even though he's at the top, doesn't want to do it just on swagger. He, he, he literally does want to constantly improve and looks at areas where he's weak. And, you know, so I can understand why he's like a coach's player in that sense. And that sick thing where he's got that illness and he actually even said in yeah. an interview recently, he thought this was going to be the worst year of his career because he thought, well, fuck, I'm going to be dealing with all this illness. Now, it's literally the best despite that. What a what a baller. Yeah. Um, so so moving on, let's talk a little bit about Na'Vi. And I only really want to talk about the final and then we're going to move on to Roster Mania. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I, like there was a lot of people like, uh, you know, oh, God, it's ter- you know, tragic Na'Vi in a final. Yeah. I mean, they were outclassed from start to finish in, yes. in this game, and I, I think it really showed a lot of the deficiencies that, that that I always expected them to have. I'm amazed it took getting to a major final and playing Astralis to really expose those deficiencies because Zeus really wasn't anywhere, and you know, Simple didn't have that great uh, game where he takes over a whole series. And there's your problems right there in a nutshell. That it was Electronic was the standout player in the final, and nobody really else. And I, man for man, how do you beat a team like Astralis when you're relying on, you know, 30-year-old veterans, non-fragging in-game leaders? The, the, the ESL1 Cologne uh, final still blows my mind thinking about it, that they were able to overcome this opponent. The semi-final, but yeah. So, so, so semi-final, you're right. Um, and, but yeah, just very strange. And yes. uh, that, that it, it, they were able to do it then. Certainly not now. If you go and look at that game and everything that happened in that game, it just shows how far Na'Vi are. Solidly number two, I would say. I can't dispute that as the ranking. But so far apart, the distance between number one and number two in that sense. So the question becomes, there was a lot of talk about problems coming into the major. Obviously, famously, the flamey issue. There were people that posted stuff to Reddit saying that I was in the crowd and I saw Simple and Edward and Zeus arguing. That seems to be the tone in every Na'Vi lineup going right back to when Guardian was on the team. Um, it's just Zeus's way. I don't know why he still does it because people obviously don't like it. But are we, are we ever likely to see a lineup change? Is Na'Vi getting to the final of a major and having an underwhelming performance enough to maybe kickstart one roster change, especially when the CIS players out there with a lot of talent that could definitely improve this roster? That's a really tough call because on yeah. the one hand, 
I mean, as you said, listen, it's a team that's won tournaments. It's a team that actually, the maddest thing about the Na'Vi lineup is their actual consistency in terms of placings has been amazing, except for like losing to North at DreamHack Stockholm. I think every other event might have been top four for the entire time they've had electronics. So in terms of like the consistency you dream of having as an in-game leader, that's, that's about as good as you can hope for. You can't expect to win every event, but you want to crack at it. You want to be in the semis every time. So the, the, the big problem I have here is whether or not the players themselves are comfortable with this. Because if they really do think that bullshit of like, ah, well, we came second, you know, we'll get him next time. Ah. Like, if they really believe that, then that's depressing. Because, yeah, I don't think they'll be able to go further as a team. Because this is an example of where I read this final completely the other way. For me, I thought that this was a team that had to try and win this major yep. or move on. It was time to make a new direction and to get a different player. And I don't know what direction. I could be. There could be many that I wouldn't anticipate. Maybe getting an unknown player. Who knows, right? But the point is, it's like if you won this major, it was only going to be by these two guys, Simple and Electronic, hard carrying the fuck out of your team. Yeah. I mean, I know for this one, actually, I think for this major flame, he had much better stats. But generally, that's not something you can expect for him. So if it takes that to not win the tournament, you've got to move on at this point in time, guys. Like that's like that you can't. That's unreasonable to expect from those players. That would be like if you were a team and then everyone was telling you, "Oh, shore up your midfield, mate. Your team's not." And you're like, "Nah, it's no problem. These two goal scorers score thirty goals every season, and I come second. Yeah. It's like, yeah. that ain't good enough, is it? What happens if they have a 25-goal season? And, and and this is what I mean. I, I, you know, I think they're at that mouse sports stage where it's like you definitely need to make a change if you want to be number one. But you've got to be so careful in the change that you make because it ha- it could push you all the way down to, like, number eight. Sure. Um, they, they've got a, There's such a delicate balance out there. There's some names that are getting kicked around. You know, people are talking about Hobbit to Na'Vi. Uh, over Edward, I, I don't know about that. Honestly, I think Hobbit's an amazing player. I, I really like him. I, I think that uh, blend doesn't feel right for me. What for me? I, I think what Navi needed in place of Edward is a Zipnix type player. You know, somebody that is very savvy, able to lock down bomb sites, great clutching production, but also doesn't mind kind of enabling and setting people. There doesn't really seem to be anybody like that on Narvi. Edward isn't the guy that's going to do it. What Ed- Edward's strength is in his, uh, you know, trade uh, fragging. That, that yes. that's what he that's what he does really well. That's the only thing he does really well. His use of utility is embarrassing for a tier one pro, frankly. Um, and and just in terms of like raw aim, motherfucker's dirty. You, you know, like you can't ever expect him. You shouldn't need that on Navi with the players you've got. But equally as well, like it's like simple has to have these incredible moments in a vacuum. Electronic has to have it in a vacuum. They're not getting any help. They're just that good. They can just w- yes. will it to happen. And I think if you added a player that had the kind of skill set of a Zipnix to this lineup. You, you, they can give Astralis a hell of a game. Now, the reality is, I don't know who that player is from the CIS region. Um, it's certainly not Hobbit. That isn't his That's game. That's the thing. Historically, the closest you'd come was probably a Dread. Like, I know people yeah. are going to think of a Dread in Gambit, who was like a star player as well. But listen, especially if you go back in time, those early CSGO lineups, the Virtus Pro lineup, Astana Dragons, he wasn't like a, a featured player in these teams, you know. He very much was... He already was old back then. He was one of those guys where it's like, right, I'll just do what needs to be done, fill in some of the gaps. You know, mm-hmm. Dorsier here is the star player or Kutra, whoever it was in those lineups, you know, Markov. These other players can take the big sort of spotlight and I'll just do my job. I know he's a guy as well, by the way, who has the mentality for it. Like, he has a very, very good veteran's mentality. The problem is he's also old as fuck. Like, I don't know, off yeah. the top of my head, I'm going to assume Adren's 28, 29, pretty old guy as well. He's another player where I have my qualms about why they play like mm. part of me feels like it is just financially a very smart move to continue being a CS goal player right now. So the problem is if you want to bring people into a team like this and go for number one, you want it to be a guy who's hungry, you know, we're really going to kill yeah. for it. That's why maybe, it, maybe you do gamble on a Vegas squadron player, someone like someone less well known. Cause the logic is right. This guy might go all out for it. And if, if he's the right guy, if I've picked the right dude, yeah. then that could be the, the piece that takes me to the top. Because I mean, there isn't an obvious move, like you said. There's not like a guy who's just screaming up, just get this guy and we'll be we'll be there right now. There's, there's not really anyone like that, I don't think. Yeah, and obviously we're talking <laughs> about Vegas Squad and Chopper's the big star player there, but then you have the same problem. He's he's not the guy for this lineup. Yes. Um, you know, you maybe Kashanda could do that kind of role. I 
don't think so. This is the great tragedy about seized. This is why. Let me let yeah. me tell you. Let me tell you about the sad. Twenty sixteen seized here oh, now. Oh, mate, be awesome, yeah. wouldn't it? Yeah, twenty sixteen seized playing in that team instead of Edwards. That's the number one team in the world, right? Or, or certainly very fucking close to it. You would have an epic rivalry with Astralis. Unfortunately, that player doesn't exist anymore. Seized is washed up. He's never going to get back to the light. It's never going to happen. Uh, so who, who you've got to find a player like that 2016 Seas, like the Zipniks, somebody who can just you know do all of that good stuff that enables star players to truly, truly shine. But you always get your moments as well. You're good for like two, three rounds just by yourself. You know, vital impact rounds. Um, I, I think Adren could be a good pickup over Edward. I know it doesn't really fix the youth problem. I think Adren is just a much more cultured player. Um, but yeah, I mean, I thought it could have been Mir. I haven't really been sold since he moved to Gambit. I know he didn't get a fair crack, but I haven't given up on him because, like you say, yeah, I, f- I still feel as though he hasn't like been really given whatever his role should be. You know, like yeah. like it's a bit like when Electronic joined Navi, you could see something was off. You know, it can't. Yeah, they sure. can't just be night and day shit now. All of a sudden, you know, you're probably not using them the right way. And yeah. again, sadly, those CIS teams really do seem like they have. I always used to blame it on people like Nip because they were so high profile. They seem like they still run that shit of like, right, well, I've got mouse bots and I'll play this, so you're joining for whatever's left, which is like, that's not really a professional sportsman's mentality in the modern day. You know, if you're the in-game leader now, it's not about playing favorites with a guy who used to, like, Edward used to be one of your best players, great, but he, clearly if he's in this team, has to take all the worst roles. He just has to. Yeah, and and listen, and I, I, obviously people are putting this in the chat. It can never happen. The 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 language barrier, I believe, is too much of an issue. But you know, it, at this point, Stico coming in for Edward, yeah, I, I, you know, if that was ever a viable move, which it isn't, you know, if we're just playing fucking fantasy Counter Strike here, I'd do it. I, I'd get, I, I'd definitely throw that fucking hail mary up there. Because, uh, you know, despite how maligned he, he was... He's actually spot, someone who might even fucking learn Russian. Yeah, no, ma- yeah, mate. I don't know if you, we're going we're gonna to get to Stiko in a bit. I don't know if you saw the fucking twit longer he put out today. It's one of the most eloquent, yeah, intelligent got, twit longers this, ever written by a pro this player. Is the, this is the saddest thing, Richard, is during the peak of when everyone was going balls deep on him and every forum post, yeah. every game about how shit he is at the game... So this is the time period when I remember talking to him about being on a team and what his role was and stuff. And I'm not exaggerating. Of all the pro players I've met in the last five years, he would be like top five in terms of the right mentality for their role. Like totally. And it's not one of those things where you just know what to say to sound like you're the guy who's all in on the team concept. No, no. He really understood that his job was to make space for Oscar to op where Oscar wants to op and was to give a gun to this other player and was to follow up someone and rush in first so they could bait for him. He he didn't just say all that shit like because it sounds good and it's a way to make up for Edward being shit in Na'Vi like they try to do now. He actually believed it all. That's why when they kicked him, I didn't have to know how Snacks was going to play. I didn't have to know what was going to go on in my spots. And know that if you kick out that player and you bring in someone who is night and day nothing like that in terms of mentality you are going to radically affect the chemistry of this team because that's an example of one of those people i always name like a zipniks where it's like sometimes even just the lack of them having an ego helps the bigger egos because now there's not another person to crash into them all the time you know it's like they get a bit more space to even be an egotistical star player type con yeah, it's it's worth adding as well that he did add to the uh, twit longer uh, that he thinks he can speak good enough Russian. Oh, that's cool. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that was there in the draft that I read this morning or whether I just accidentally skimmed. I right know over people it. from that region because mm. of obviously the history of the Soviet. Yeah, sure, sure. Usually have like a a, yeah, a, a, a rudimentary a, understanding. Yeah, like they yeah. definitely need to tune it up, like Guardian did, obviously. But but put it this way, it's a very different from being like. Just put fucking crims on Navi. Like, yeah, that's never gonna happen. Okay. Yeah, of course, right? <laughs> well, look, let's let's talk about Stiko. Obviously, he left Cloud Nine. He put this twit longer out. Um, I mean, listen, in the same way that I remember when uh Lurpis was pushing to get Arlu on NIP, um, and was endlessly banging on about it until he sort of fucking memed it into reality. I could definitely do something similar for Stiko on Navi for Edward. I mean, that would take all the boxes for me. I think Stiko is, again, a very cultured player that doesn't get the plaudits he deserves because of the roles that he's willing to take on himself. And then when he fragged out of control at fucking, you know, in this very, very bad Cloud9 team, uh, everybody said, oh, he he's playing loads better now. And it's like by his own, you know, if you read this twit longer, he actually says, 
no, I'm not. I'm I, I playing worse. You just don't understand the game. So you put out this really long twit. I'm, I'm not obviously going to read the whole fucking thing. That would probably take up the rest of the podcast. Which, by the way, that is pretty baller. I can't lie. Yeah. After everyone finally goes, you know what? I thought you were shit, but actually you played pretty well. And he goes, oh, my friend, you don't understand this game at all, do you? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. No, literally. He actually, like, styled on him. No, no. The, the <laughs> level of respect I have for him, I mean, it was, all, it was always high. Because, you see, I remember when he was the fucking Mad Fragger. You know, go look at some of his highlight movies. I remember when he was, like, pugging. He can do those things, but he understands the team game perhaps better than, you know, I'd say 90% of pro players. He understands that if you want the fucking glittering trophy in the cabinet, can't all be about you. And he has the wherewithal and the lack of ego to fit into a system and actually welcomes fitting into a system. He says here, um, you know, talking about how he lost motivation. Now, when players lose motivation, first of all, how many of them actually go to their managers and the people signing their checks and go, listen, guys, I've lost motivation. Is there any way you can help me get it back? Most people just keep that shit to themselves. Stiko didn't. Mod- model that fucking- scarcity mindset where they think, fuck, I'm going to be yeah. out the door if I admit yeah. that. What a, what a model fucking pro. What a great advertisement you know that is just in itself of with the kind of person you want at your organization said i was losing motivation immediately told the org and immediately spoke to a sports psychologist you know what a fucking baller and then um you know like i say he talks about here he goes um i've been trying uh, when we got to the major with cloud nine i was trying to be on point individually and building game plans for our opponents but the more we played the more lost i felt since cloud nine had a golden into our roster he obviously became our leader but it was different Golden is a great leader and a born leader. It's just his style is so hard for me to learn. Three years ago, I became a pro player, and ever since, I was put into positions that benefit a slow play style. I was too passive for what Golden needed me to do, and I was struggling to make quick and proactive slash reactive decisions in clutches, 4v5 or 5v5 scenarios. It always took me two seconds longer to figure out the correct play that we wanted to use. I wasn't on the same page as this team at all. This is the reason for our poor performance at the major. So he puts it all on himself, and he identifies his his weakness. Um, I feel like I was doing tons of mistakes. Even when we faced Hellraisers, everyone told me I did great. I had to tell them, shut up, because it really pissed me off. The game isn't about stats, and I was making mistakes every second round. Um, so he just says, you know, no hard feelings to me or Cloud9. I couldn't adapt to Golden Style. So what it tells you there is that, like, you know, Stiko knows he's never going to fit in to that explosive style that you get with a lot of teams out there. It, what are Na'Vi known for? You know, I mean, like, the old school Na'Vi was the slow system, the Zeus system. And now it, that's kind of been overshadowed because you have electronic and simple doing these explosive things. It sounds like culturally it could be a very good fit um, just on that basis alone. And then, you know, he just adds that he's open to all the offers. And, uh, yeah, this is a player that for me should should be on a top-tier team. Um, he's, a, he's one of those rare breed of players that will give your stars what they need, wants to play in a slow system, wants to have the minutia, doesn't want it all to be fucking rock'em, sock'em robots. I mean, this is a this is a cerebral player we're talking about. So, the thing yeah. is, though, he needs the right team for sure. Like, oh, even, like actually, his own even admission, as, sure. as much as we're, like, analyzing here, like, could he join Na'Vi? Mm. I think being with, like, fucking Zeus would be <laughs> the nightmare scenario if you're a stickle. Because, as you say, part of it's, like, cultivating in him the notion that we we understand that it's not about stats you know if you look bad in this game but we win you did your job whereas i have to sit like that like what's funny is when i was thinking about this the perfect sort of person for him to be in game like but would be carrigan if you think about when carrigan joined that phase team and he yeah. set about going like right what can i actually do with this team and if you remember one of the big moves was he, he brought back Kiyoshima and the whole reason he brought him back was exactly this. It was yeah. like, right, you know what? You didn't really have a place in the team, but I could use you in this one. I need a player who can do that. You sound like you're the, the man for the job. So I'll bring you back. And it, obviously it worked. It was pretty good. It, it was part of what took them along the steps to become one of the best teams. So I think he needs someone who would recognize that though, which yeah. sadly in some of the teams he's been in, maybe it wasn't the case. Yeah. And, and may, maybe it is Zeus. Maybe Zeus could do that. I don't know. But certainly, I, I just think, into, like, you don't need any more star players in there. You don't need any more firepower. You need the water carrier. You know, you need the fucking Marcel Desailly. They are a surprisingly that, you know, shit you need the Didier team Deschamps. Is Narvi, if you think about it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. For sure. They just don't have... Whereas, um, he, like, think about what... That's another thing Astralis has. Mm. I was thinking this when I was watching the final, right? So if I'm watching another team... The best example here, obviously, like, G2... 
If you're yeah. watching G2 and Shox is alive, anything's possible. This clutch is on. If you're watching it's Body and Smiths, you just give up already. You know that that 2v4 isn't going to be won, right? Whenever Astralis is in any 2vx situation, there's no combination feels impossible for them to win a round. Yeah. Like, yeah, I was thinking this the other day. It doesn't have to be Device and Zipmix. It doesn't have to be Dupree and Device. Like, there is literally any two players alive have a chance to win the round if it's Astralis. Yeah. Exactly. What fucking team can brag about that? And that's with all the other advantages they have. So in Navi, they have a lack of that, I think. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah electronic and simple can win some clutches. I wouldn't put my money on any of the others, too. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. Um, so anyway, so Stiko's out there in free agency and uh, definitely somebody that deserves to be on a team. Uh, again, I'll try and will it into reality. I managed to dodge Navi winning the major, so maybe I'm in charge of the simulation for just a little bit. Let's talk about who Cloud9 signed as his replacement. So, I mean, imagine if you'd been in a fucking coma, Duncan, and you woke up. You woke up yeah. like, oh, God. Oh, God. Yeah. Um, how are Cloud9 doing? I went into the coma somewhere around about uh, the, the winning bot, the Boston Major. What light up? Like, to, to fucking sign Flusher is, is madness. I, I don't know what's going on over at uh, Cloud9. I mean, you know, I've I've got a lot of respect for Jack. I, I think the lunatics are running the asylum here. I mean, if if Flusher, like I, I don't know, if if Flusher had shown me anything back in that sort of fanatic lineup, um, you know, sure. And Golden did seem to be getting some mileage out of him as an in-game leader, so maybe that's a pairing that can work and rejuvenate Flusher's fortunes. But he was garbage this major. I mean, like the idea that he gets to leave Fnatic and just move to Cloud Nine based on his performances uh, is mind-boggling to me. It's like nobody's ever heard of the concept like washed up, you know, in 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 Counter Strike. And the they also, shit, likewise, don't make you ever prove yourself again. Like here's no. the thing: if he goes to another team. Red Reserve would be an obvious example. And he shows that he's sick. Now I understand why Cloud9 goes, we're the ones that are going to give him a chance and bring him back to... It's the idea that what people do, say with Mouse Sports recruiting snacks, is they literally go, like the worst businessman's deal ever. They go, right, I'm going to buy someone at current price, top value, yeah. for maybe they could be as good as they were two years ago. That's the shittest deal ever. Why, why would you take those deals? Like, doesn't even make sense. Yeah, this this is really fucking strange. Like, this is like paying top dollar for for players just so far past the prime. It's unreal. And the statement Flusher made when he when he um, joined is is so mind bogglingly disingenuous. Uh, he says here, Johnny Cloud Nine is one of those opportunities that it just felt right for me to pursue. Which obviously that part makes sense. Getting to play with hungry players that want to achieve what I once achieved is a big motivator because I am not done yet. Where are the hungry players on this team? What, Tim? Like, Rush has checked the fuck out. Let, by the way, Automax said he'd lost motivation himself, remember? Yeah, right. <laughs> and so, always yeah. his comment on yeah, how so, he plays other games. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so Tim said he's lost motivation and is constantly joking about Fortnite. Rush has mentally checked the fuck out. Skadoodle, do you know what I mean? Like, come on. He's not fucking hungry, is he? In what world is Skadoodle hungry? Like, he, he is literally the, the, the archetypal player who will just play forever as long as it's in that one organization. He'll just constantly take that check, but doesn't want the pressure of having That's to the, I've, go I've down to before. lower leagues and prove himself. And that is like the that. maddest he, thing about Skadoodle to me, yeah. is that if, if Cloud9, I told this to Jack straight up personally, I said, you do realize if you kick him tomorrow, he retires and never plays another game again. Yeah, that's how fucking I said, hungry that he is. Exactly. If that's the if that's his literal plan B, why are you why is he your plan A? That doesn't yeah. even make sense, mate. Like he doesn't even want to be in this game. He I just mean, won't I, give up a cushy job playing in your team as is. I can only assume the hunger applies to Golden because I could believe that, sure. No, I mean, he must be fucking hungry because think about it. Like he had a successful fanatic team, got unbelievably wrecked by the players. Uh, and I suggest this reunion maybe even intimates that Flusher wasn't one of the players who wanted him out. Because uh, I, I think it'd be very hard for me to want to play with somebody that, yeah, hey, we'll just put you in refragger and completely fuck up your stats and then use that as the premise to kick you when you've just helped us win these fucking tournaments uh, when we haven't looked like a tournament-winning side for ages. Um, so maybe maybe they have that good relationship. I can understand Golden being very hungry. He needs this to work. Unfortunately, what I saw at the Major was... Really uninspired shit tactics 
uh, being, you know, like, I don't know if he needs to dumb it down and keep it simple or whether he feels he's hampered with the tools that he's got at his disposal. But, you know, buy CZs, group up on Banana, rush through Molly's, hope to get killed. You're not winning me over. I- I've always been a huge fucking proponent of Golden. He should never have been removed from Fnatic in a million years. But, brother, like, this is this is the next big shot, right? And if you fuck this up, revisionist history dictates you will not be remembered as a great IGL. Yes. Um, so you've got to think about that. People will even go back and retcon how good you were on Fnatic. That's how this game is played. So I can understand him being hungry. The idea that Flush is hungry, obviously, I assume... That's lit- so implausible. Lit- like, think about this. So he apologizes in this twit longer for being the one who spread the negativity. And he literally yeah, apologized to all his teammates, did. right? So someone who was playing, as we've said, in a team that won massive tournaments, that had, in theory, some good players. In fact, obviously, some legendary players in the lineup. So he didn't have Hungo playing with them, but going and playing with fucking a half-motivated automatic, washed-up rush, and Skadoodle shouldn't even be there. That's getting him all jazzed up in the morning. And presumably, he's going to have to go to NA. Fuck off. I mean, I, I think probably part of it is, you know how it is with some teams, right? They stay in the fucking relationships a little bit too long, like yes. Virtus Pro, you know? And, and uh, eventually they realize, like, th- this actually is a loveless marriage. This is fucking garbage. Well, like like you know, Gambit what? recently. Looks yeah, like the same yeah, scenario, yeah, you know? yeah, exactly. Like, the spark just fucking goes. Um, you know, it's like you say, I, I think a change is as good as a rest, sure. But this is ridiculous. I don't think Cloud9 get good mileage out of Flusher. Like straight up, I I think I think this is I think he's a washed up player. I, I could I, I even think... see him playing worse because like when I think of yeah. Flusher's strengths, he's played his entire career basically with the same core of players. So all those genius like passive fucking flanks and weird little moves he would make, that all helps if you know the inside and outside way that all your teammates are going to play and where they're going to be on the map and what they'll respond. Good luck doing that when it's like players who don't even come from the same culture and have a totally different vision of the game. You know, I feel like that's actually going to take away what in theory is one of his long term strengths, like a hallmark of his game. And and let me let me tell you just another thing off off the top. If like like you talked about Carrigan and Kiyoshima, if the thought process is is by Golden is to bring in a muse, you know, like every in game leader has their go to guy. If Flusher is that go to guy, nothing's going to fucking sow dissent and fucking you know, jealousy or anger or whatever in a fucking team that's ostensibly American with a lineup that's played together and want to fucking major together than a new IGL picking up a fucking legendary player and then giving him all the fucking shine. It, it, this is a recipe for fucking disaster. I'm, I'm fucking, I'm all on board. It's been an absolute clusterfuck. It's going to be a glorious watch. It's going to be a glorious watch. But, you know, unless this is part of some sort of repurposing Cloud9 as the fucking Swedish dream team and Olaf's around the corner and, 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 so, and you know, Br- Broland's coming, you know, like this is dumb as fuck. I mean, you know, it is literally like it, 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 it reeks of when an organization just wants to have a CS team by hook or by crook and they just do uh, whatever, you know? Um, so, really fucking weird. And I guess on that note, well, why don't we move on to an organization that is having a CS team just to have one? Envious are back, apparently. So there was this report by uh, DK put out that Envious are coming back into the fucking scene. I'm like, okay, this is exciting. Because they ran things down the fucking tubes with the French roster. So this must be a fucking good one. Nah, of course it's not. It, it's, it's, I mean, first of all, I'll say this. JDM, sure, too good for free agency. Uh, but I, the rest of this team is a fucking nightmare. If you were an envious guy getting, wow, envious is coming to NA, um, you know, like fucking, what are we talking about? What is, is, is like Cutler going to come back? You know, are they, ta- are they really going to take that tr- trio from splice of Cutler drone and Semphis? What is fucking occurring here? Uh, like, this is madness. This is like, like you said, are there just some players who just get to have a team forever? Despite never playing well, how the fuck is Cutler still getting work in 2018? Did I miss a fucking meeting? And where where are the big names in the team? For anyone who goes, well, what do you mean, Thor? just said JDM. Yeah, JDM has to work his way back in. I agree with you. Just like Stanislaw when he got cut from Liquid, players who clearly should be in the scene, you know, and they should be getting another chance. But 
you know, people are a bit soured to how it ended, and so it, people have to wait a while, and the right chance has to come along. But like, why Nifty joining this team is some sort of for raw? Yeah, that was going to be the next. And yeah. then, yeah, as you say, like I don't know enough about Drone. Maybe he is some sort of up and coming player. But the other two are the definition of washed up. Cutler and yeah. Zemphis are known quantities. Who you know what? If you have like one of them, yeah, you could probably have one of them in a team like this. That sounds fair enough. Why are two of them and then an unproven person in the drawn guy? Like, like the whole nothing about it thematically makes sense. I don't know what you think you're getting from buying buying the squad, unless it's some sort of a mad budget squad. And except, but I have to say, sadly, from knowing what I've known about NACS go for the last few years, I'd go ahead and say there isn't a mad budget squad, and they're probably on some really nice fucking salary and a big setup, and they're about to just piss half of that away for six months. Well, I'll I'll tell you this. Like I say, in terms of Semphis, I got a lot of time for Semphis uh, as a person. I think he's I think he's a, a smart guy. He keeps it fucking real. I'm pretty sure he knew as soon as his roster was announced that we were gonna fucking go in and roast it. I don't know if he can ever be a top player again. He's got his life together. Uh, I don't know why he'd want to uh, potentially undo that and get back into the fucking swamp uh, that is being an NA pro. That's up to him. Um, I don't think he's the worst thing about this team by a fucking country mile. Uh, This idea that drone, like, they're only taking on the Splice trio because they want to get that fucking NA slot, and obviously Splice. Yes, uh, that makes sense, I guess. Yeah, yeah. you know, Splice are just like fucking, they'll just sell anything. You know, they don't give a fuck. It's just like, let's just keep the lights on. Let's just keep fucking bringing money in, making it look like we're running a competent business over here at Splice. Uh, So I understand it. But again, drone? Who the fuck is drone? Why why do I even know this guy's name? What's he ever fucking done? What, I'm supposed to be excited about this? No, I'm fucking not. And as I said, Cutler, fuck me. It, it, it's mind-boggling to me. Um, and then, like you say, let's talk about now we get the fucking Nifty thing being thrown in. Let me tell you what an unprecedented disaster that would be. First of all, for Nifty, he doesn't deserve to be playing with the likes of fucking Cutler. And He's done nothing wrong. That's ridiculous. And then second of all, how the fuck is this going to work? Nifty, the primary AWPA, the unbelievable AWPA, some people say arguably a better AWPA than JDM, playing in a team with JDM, a good NA AWPA from what we last saw of him, who cannot rifle. Who, who's, who's making way here? It's going to have yeah. to be Nifty, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. So what a fucking, what an absolute nightmare. What an absolute nightmare this is on paper as a concept. I mean, you know... <laughs> I, I just don't even know what the fuck's going on here. There's there, there's nothing about this team that screams good idea, let alone, again, just walking into an organization. Like you say, I know enough about Hastro. Got many flaws as a fucking team owner. Got many flaws as a person. But, like, they'll be on some fat fucking salaries with yeah. benefits. My they assumption will, is... He will look he, after the players, for sure. If he comes back, it's because he really thinks somehow, I don't know how, but one day this is going to be a top team again. Like, he, it, he seems to have that approach where you try to go all out in theory when you have a team, you know. Yeah, well, so this is how, obviously, it has to happen, right? they got to take the splice court and get that fucking NA spot thing in, in ESL or whatever the fuck. And then they're going to have to slowly, like, Theseus' ship just eye and, you know, get rid of shit player number one, get rid of shit player number two, get rid of shit player number three, and eventually bring somebody in. This, this, this is like Renegades or something. It, it, it's going to have no cohesion. It's going to have no consistency. It, 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 it is going to be just another splice type team, but it's just going to be playing for envious. I do not understand it. Uh, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to bang on people. I respect like fucking Zemphis, but again, as a player Cutler to me is, is, is a, an absolute joke. Uh, you know, uh, did we not see enough in CLG and drone? As I said, I, another one of those NA players who just shouldn't have a name, but because of fucking ESEA rank S and everything else, like they just blow up needlessly when they're garbage. Like, did we not learn anything from Roker? Uh, have we learned nothing? You know, that's why I love it when people people always love to bring up anytime Stewie Two K is being celebrated. They're always like, you know, Thorin said he wouldn't make it. Like, have you ever heard of the concept of the exception that proves the rule? The fact that he did make it and then not only made it but was one of the best. Yeah, that's the point. Most of them are going to fail so completely that the rare time one comes along, it probably is going to be really good. You know. But yeah, the point I mean, is, you don't get this crop of people you don't know just coming through, sadly. I, I, I was quite fortunate in that regards, because I actually thought he was going to be the one who made it. So it makes me look like I know what the fuck I'm talking about. But you're right. I mean, how many NA Pug stars have we seen down the fucking years? That's why the Roker example you know, is the great counter example. Yeah, of course it you is. You have to understand 
Sean Gares. Sean Gares. There are nine Rokers. You know? Sean Gares, after Roker had already shown himself to be somewhat underwhelming in his previous team, still picked up Roker for the Echo Fox team for exactly this reason. He really thought... Maybe it's just the other in-game leaders or something. Maybe yeah, if I, I have him and I use something. him. Yeah. And he had to learn himself the hard way, the very, you know, idiosyncratic flaws that that player had that basically meant he was never going to be a top pro. So even people, it, my point is it can go the other way. A guy, you have top people telling you, no, no, I think this can work. Sometimes it doesn't work in that way. So yeah, I agree with you. There's, there's too many names where it's like, it's weird because people go so hard one way or the other. It's either like, if I don't know them, they can't be good. It's like, well, don't go too far. You know, obviously you've got to cultivate yeah. new talent. Or it's like, let anyone through. Give them all a chance. It's like that thing we're putting daps on the major for his first ever tournament. Yeah. You know what? He might have gone on to be the best analyst ever. The point is that you don't need to take that gamble. Like, odds are he won't be. And guess what? He wasn't. So in that scenario, when you're talking about the best or a high-level team, pick someone who's already worth the quality you know. Let the other yeah. guy prove himself. I know it's often framed that that we're like super critical. We, we you know we're we're always um, you know banging on like new players coming through. Holy shit, man! The amount of recycled, washed up cunts that are still getting work. I welcome. I welcome it. Yeah. I welcome it. I mean, you know, I, I very publicly apologized about the Issa thing because I was very dismissive about him before I'd even seen him play. Uh, which I don't usually do that as a fucking rule. It just felt the idea that a good player was going to come out with Jordan felt so far fucking fetched that sure. the fact that he, he turns out to be one of the great all-rounders in World Counter-Strike is still mind-blowing to me. But I'll apologize. I'll own my bull bullshit when I'm wrong or if I don't like if I don't research something before I give an opinion about it. Like you got to. That's how you got to live your life. But yeah, dude, there are there are young players in America right now with attitude problems better than guys on this roster. It just reeks of like Look, we need this slot. We'll bring you in. Here's the salary. You're playing on borrowed time. This team is going to do absolutely nothing. It's going to do fuck all. And, of course, you then have to factor in, talking about another team like that, you got the Renegade situation. So Sponge comes straight out of the fucking major, tweets what we're all thinking because he's like that because he's a fucking baller. Uh, we all talked about it during the No Majors Club. You know, you've got to get, send the Aussies back, man. You've got to fucking send them back. Just, this is it now. Go back to Australia, get an Australian team. Maybe you come back to NA in the future. But you cannot fucking stay playing for Renegades. This is like, uh, it's just embarrassing now that you fucking come through the age and qualify. And it would be easier because Ty Lu obviously got fucking, you know, legends. They're going to be back in the next match. Yep. They're not going to have to qualify. So it would be even easier to fucking do. You can't. It just reeks of no ambition. And Sponge fucking said it. But now what we've got is you bring in a coach to fucking fix the problem in Ryu. He's there for what? The major. He put a twit longer out. I'm going to try and get him to come on the show because it's been 128 episodes since I had Ryu on the show. Um, so I think he's due another appearance. Uh, you know, he's talking about fucking... I can't talk too much about what's going on behind the scenes. Obviously, this is a fucking... I know exactly what's going on behind the scenes. It, 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 it's either a lack of ambition or the fact that you and Nifty are going to go somewhere else. That's it. That was all it ever could be. You can't make the Aussies work in this. Uh, you know, and you, coming through the Asian qualifier is a fucking poor way to run your team. I know Jonas knows this. It, they need to get an, they need to get an NA team and fucking rebuild. And it's a shame it's not going to be with Ryu and Nifty, honestly. But what a what a what a joke that was. Like we didn't see that coming, Amalo. So some some thoughts about Renegades, if you have any. I'm guessing. I mean, I definitely right. agree on the the angle that like it's just I actually I, I legitimately think it is pathetic. Pathetic is the word for thinking. Yeah, but I can always go through the uh, Asia Minor. Why are you even in the minor every time? Because yeah. you fucking never did anything at a major ever. And that's even in an era where major the first weeks the fucking qualifier now. How incompetent yeah. are you? But you have to rely on the fact that basically China and Korea don't care enough about CSGO to just straight up replace you in that. Exactly. Yeah. So instead, your lack of ambition is like, at least I get to go to the major. It's like, oh, brilliant. Yeah, going to the major, coming last place. What a celebration, you know. Like, Listen. Like, where's the ambition? Either you should have gone the other way and gotten more NA players and just made yourself a better team and then win yeah. out that way. Or as you're saying, just be in, just be the best Australian roster. Then, like shit, yeah. I'll get off the pot on that one. Yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't think Jonas is going to tolerate it much more. I, I'm expecting the announcement any time. In fact, when I saw Ryu was gone, I thought the Aussies were following him out the fucking door. Frankly, you know, you've got a, you've got a brand that has some tenure. 
It's actually not that bad. Detroit Renegades, you know, I, I can understand the marketing potential with this. They've had some other good teams. They've got some history there that they can certainly like leverage, you know, like for example, probably not a lot of people know this, but Ninja, the biggest streamer in the world actually was with Renegades for a time um, on their Halo team uh, back in t 2016. Um, so, you know, there's an org, there's like some status attached that you can go out there and, and get some fucking investment. But like Aussie players, like this is cutting corners, dog. And you got to fucking, you, you know, if you want to be an NA team, get some good NA players. Not Don't do this envious shit. And try and keep holding Nifty. He's like the jewel in the fucking crown right now. I can't believe you're going to let him go to to envious. It makes no sense. So, I mean, we saw, we saw the Renegade shit coming a mile off. So that's not even that newsworthy. Um, right, okay, what else do we have uh, in terms of crazy roster changes? I've got a fucking list here. There was definitely something else. I feel like I'm missing something. Can't kick, kick my old man memory in. Oh, yeah, we didn't We didn't even talk about Scream the Fanatic, did we? Did yes, we talk about that? no, no, we didn't do that one. Yeah, so there you go. Um, so let's talk about this. Scream going into Fnatic. I mean, that's another one of these, like, you know, washed up, underwhelming player, just rizzle, rizzle, dizzles his way into a fucking top team without having to prove anything. Doesn't even necessarily need to speak the lingo. It seems like you can just you just get a go because like you're you're a big name, you got a big Instagram. I don't I don't know about that move either. It's not as bad as the flush at the cloud nine move. It's not a permanent move, so that, yeah, that, that, that definitely helps. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I, I can see I can I can see how maybe. Maybe that would work. But again, I, f I feel like Fnatic is starting to lose its way, lose its identity, losing the things that made it good, um, losing the things that were there to build on. And that now you're talking what, like, we've had to let Flusher go because he was like some toxic influence. Um, we're bringing Scream in. Um, don't really understand that. Don't. I've said it a billion times. Exist. How is he going to fucking get anything out of Scream when he couldn't get anything out of the team that he just had? You've still got the problems with Draken, you know, ongoing that he needs to be more consistent and better with the up. So I don't I don't fucking know, mate. I, I don't know what Fnatic are up to right now. Again, it feels like they're just kind of spinning plates until they actually get something close to the team that they want. But this move to me, you know, sure, maybe, maybe Scream turns up and because there's no pressure on him and it's not a permanent move, he just starts banging fucking heads off again. He's like the old Scream that we all know and love. I don't think I don't think Scream ever gets back to those heights, and certainly not in this lineup. But I don't know what you think about it. Like since since he's a standing, and it's for this ESL New York event. Yeah. Like, if it really was a scenario, like you're going to play one LAN or I don't know two LANs, whatever initial temporary period, and the logic isn't even like well then we'll see. It's like you're probably only playing those LANs. If you really have to have just a hired mercenary for one event, it's not a bad one to pick. You think the yourself, yeah, just get him, turn him loose, see what he does. The rest of us try and play around him. But as you say, you it, it causes the fact he is not Swedish and he has nothing in common with the history of Fnatic and the Fnatic players and how they've played. This is not in any way a step forwards along any kind of path that does get you to a real roster. Because yeah. it clearly in their team, it's not even just one player. They need to change a whole bunch of things. They need to rethink how Fnatic is going to exist as a team, how they even could be a top team again, which players can stay for my money. You might even have to make wholesale changes. So... I, this does feel just like a fucking little bit of temporary distraction before you have to go down to the real fucking which teeth are we going to pull? Yeah. Yeah, and, and they're going to have to pull some. some. Something's rotten at the core of the team. Crims is obviously the standout thing about it right now, and it's like, you know. And even he's, he's reacting off, emotionally, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's triggered off the fucking face of the earth. By the way... As a player, he is one of the most fucking sturdy players I've ever seen mindset-wise. So if he's publicly yeah. tweeting shit, like, how far has this gone? Yeah. Uh, so so that's that's a fucking weird situation for me. It's like you say, though. I, I think it's temporary. Then, um, obviously, there was this weird intim uh, intimation from Carrigan over at Faye. So we'll, we'll, we'll use this to spiral into the Danish stuff. Um, Carrigan did a tweet saying, I, I'm going to need a chair. Uh, which I, I, which I think implies he's being benched, right? Yeah, but that's what I love. I love it when people try to be subtle, but in that case, yeah, it's like that's just a mad a brick to the fucking dome. That is, just cause like, yeah, you may as well, you know, guys. Just want to let you know, yeah, I'm gonna need a chair, aren't I? Yeah. Well, why is it? Why is and that? They're like, what, what, no, well, they're, no, you know, I'm gonna need to take a seat. <laughs> yeah. All right, you have one already. You got you. Yeah. Haven't you got like a DX race or something? No, no, guys. <laughs> I'm gonna 
set phases to stone and they're like fucking <laughs> just tell us what's going on already yeah it's you may as, at, that, at that point you may as well fucking you know but i understand because orgs fucking get all upset about of it course, fucking yeah. you know we all know how malicious organizations can be but um the phase situation for me is if they do bench carrigan i am gonna just call it now they're not gonna bring in an in-game leader mate they're gonna fuck their whole world up oh mate time. N- nico gonna is, nico's gonna do it mate Nico's going to roll back the years thinking he's a great fucking thinker on the game and he's capable of being a really good in-game leader. And they're going to bring in some fucking star player to play alongside while Nico's going, shut up, shut up, rush me, shut up. Like, and it's going to be an absolute fucking nightmare. It's going to be a fucking nightmare. Because I'll tell you this, Nico is one of the best fucking players in the world, but in IGL, he is not. And the other thing he is not is someone capable of reigning in his own fucking ego. He, he is out of control upstairs, right? Which is fine because you need that if you are one of the best players in the world. But then what? You're the in-game leader now and you're recruiting players. This is what they call recipe for fucking disaster. This is a nightmare yeah. for FaZe. So I, I guarantee it, if they do bench Carrigan, they're going to bring in, I don't even know who the fuck it would be, exactly. whoever Nico rates in his fucking mind. It's going to be some fucker like Sonny, isn't it? It's going to be some other, like, well, that... Yeah, okay, I agree, brilliant player, but why are we adding him? You don't need more of that, do you? Yeah. Like, you've already got... If anything, I could almost see you have a player like Sonny, but bad. You, you daft cunt, why are you bringing him in? Mate, and I've already told you yeah. as well, I've already told you the, the, the real nightmare, which FaZe fans are going to go, no, this isn't a nightmare, it's it a dream. Cool. You on. won't be telling it me in three fucking months. But this Cold Zero fucking Nico, you know, fan fiction that they've been writing themselves, Cold Zero in interviews, I'd love to play with Nico. Nico, Cold Zero is best player in the world. Shut up! You know, just this fucking weird <laughs> fucking fan fiction that they're writing. Be careful what you fucking wish for, because the grass is fucking always greener. You know what I mean? You might want to fuck your favorite porn star. The reality might be fucking not that great, right? So it, it, it is what's going to happen there. I'm sure Nico is going to float it. Again, this is all just in my mind, by the way, guys. I'm not saying I've got sources on this. Before anyone goes, takes the clip. Richard Lewis says Coldzera is joining FaZe. No, I'm not saying that. Right? I'm not fucking fishiest, dude. I'm all right. Okay, this is actually in my brain. But here's what's going to fucking happen. I'm sure and I'm pretty confident that Nico would be like, if he was asked by the org, which player would you like? To, to join in place of Carrigan now that you are the new king of the fucking team, he would go Cold Zero sat up, right? And he's going to fucking, you know, he's he, he might get his wish because let's be real, we've talked about how MIBR need to fuck, that band needs to break up. They're, you know, the, the fallen Cold Zero relationship is at a fucking impasse and the, there can only be one winner there. And in my opinion, if you want MIBR to succeed, you're back fallen. And by the way, the thing that's so suspicious about the MIBR scenario, I'll give them a little bit of leeway in this sense, right? Which is every change you make allows people a legitimate brief period to get optimistic. So what they did was, after the Stewie move just hadn't worked, they got Tarek. Okay, well, don't judge him too quickly. Give him time. We gave him time. Now we've got Yanko. Okay, okay, a little bit more time. Yeah. We've now seen him play a whole bunch of tournaments. We've seen him play. And yeah. we've seen, you know what? The ceiling, it's a bit higher than it was before. It ain't winning tournaments. There's no fucking trophy winning here. They haven't beaten any big teams in Best of X series. They haven't done no. any of the things that would be metrics and markers that you're going to become a great team. And you didn't change the entire lineup. You've been adding one player at a time. This shouldn't be that drastic, you know. So for me, I think a lot of the positivity coming out of that team in interviews is like self-hypnosis. Like, I don't believe they really buy into the idea that, you know, just adding Yankos going to take them to the top level. They're going to displace Astralis. They're going to become number one. It's their time. No, all they're hoping for is, fuck, anything better than what it was yesterday. And that can't last forever because, as we said in the past episodes, the only person on that team who really can look around and go, wait a minute, why am I even here still? Is yep. Cold Zero because he is ready to win right now. His game hasn't fucking decayed. He's still a yeah. wicked player. He still has amazing matches, but he is in a team that is in all kinds of hurt. Like, even when they get good players, that doesn't work out. They just don't have any of their old strengths. Like, to me, the real killer about MIBR is losing all that identity of being like the team that with it's like with Virtus Pro. You knew Virtus Pro was done. When they just got blown out in games. That's like the one thing that never happened to Virtus yeah. Pro. You know, they could lose. But I always used to use that like movie way of describing it. Like they could lose, but they never got beaten. You know, like that sort of shit. You know, they were getting beaten like a fucking drum by the end. It was a disgrace. So likewise, yeah. I don't see how I'm a, like, I, I don't even know what the point would be anymore. 
Like, doesn't mean I would agree with that move. Called zero to face seems like a bit of a bizarre move for everyone. But at the same time, the MIBR mixture, you've got to change it up. And I think Mate, drastically, I think it's time to tear it up. If, if Cold Zero was throwing a fucking lifeline, I'm pretty sure he'd take it. I'm, I'm not even kidding blame at this him. stage. No, I, I, I don't think so. I think that that's one case where the grass is going to look greener. And again, look, we talk about it all the time. Um, it's what, what Fallen needs to get his mojo back. Right? What Fallen always had in every Brazilian team he was always in is that he discovered you. He was this great sort of like Jesus-like yes. fucking figure in the Brazilian scene. And he discovered Cold Zero and put him in, dropping more established players to do it. Everyone looked up to him. Everybody respected him. Unfortunately, the players he's got now, you know, maybe he still gets that from Fur. I don't know. But you can see that, that the mystique has gone when Cold Zero... Imagine if I told you when that Luminosity team was breaking through with Cold Zero and it went on to become SKM. Yeah. Uh, imagine if I told you that Cold Zero was ever going to say, I'm going to be the captain now. I'm going to be the in-game leader. You wouldn't have believed me. You would have gone, nah. People fuck, don't no. realize what a mad slight that is. Because I'll tell you yeah, this no, right now. Yeah, no, it's really, it's bad. You know, when people did that storyline, I'll even say MIBR players themselves played this storyline up, which is that they claimed the reason why they fell off at the beginning of this year is because since they'd been on top for two years, you know, everyone was studying Fallen and their demos and they kind of figured out how to play them. You know what? Go back and check your timeline. Glaive's been on top for about a year and a half now. Most people would have called him, yeah. if not the best, second best thing in leader. Who's figured that guy out? If anything, he's better now than he ever was. That is a yeah. fucking nonsense angle. And there's nobody in their, his team going, you know what, Glaive, we're not winning anymore, mate. I think I'm going to be the in-game leader now. That isn't even in, on the table. So yeah, I, I, awesome. I think you're right. The the mystique around Fallen, which was, by the way, one of the sickest in-game leader mystiques ever, because obviously he could play himself individually. So you yeah. really put him on a level above anyone. He was like and a father figure across, almost, right? you know. Yeah. Now that is gone. It's not just been like pierced. I don't think even he buys it anymore. Yeah, I also that, felt like that's what I'm that was the other about. thing. It felt like not only did Cold Zero say, I want to be the in-game leader, Fallen was like, okay. It's like, where was that? Like, I'm like, Mate, no, that's definitely not an option. Sorry. Contrast the Fallen we've got now to the Fallen that's on a fucking... It's not even ancient history. On a stage saying, I'm going to turn this place into a fucking library. Yeah, Where's exactly. that? Where, where is that guy? Yeah, and, I, and 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 it's impossible to be that the swagger guy. was nuts back then as well. Oh mate, like whatever you want to say about Fallen, love him, hate the fucking guy. What he brought to the fucking game is unreal. To have the fucking balls to do something like that, say something like that, and he's you one of the few it. players who <laughs> can get away with yeah. it. He will wreck you as a fan, and you will love him for it still because of who he is, right? So imagine being that guy, and then you get undermined by the people you got to play with. Obviously, you start doubting yourself. Even fucking Fallen is going to have his moments of self-doubt and introspection. That's a that's a relationship that's got to split up. It's got to. Cold Zero's got you know he's got one eye. He's like that fucking meme. Oh, he's turning around. He's having a look, right? You know, and fucking Fallen's like, yeah, maybe Cold Zero's got a point. Maybe I ain't what I, I used to be. So for me, breaking that up in any way, I mean, people are saying, why can't Fallen go to phase? I just don't think that would happen. I think that's mental if that happens. I'd love to fucking see it. I'd like that, to see that fucking move happen, mate. That would be yeah, sick. Yeah, I mean, put, put it put it this way. If that move did happen, then any questions you have about Fallen get answered very quickly. Of course, yes. They get answered very quickly. But by the way, there's a world where that could absolutely possible. work out amazingly and he turns out to be exactly what the doctor oh, ordered. Yeah, fuck yeah. Um, also, yeah, I, can't, you know, I can't even imagine angle. Nico fucking telling Fallen to sat up. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think he would. The difference is he would he would get a renew. It, maybe it's like that thing you remember where that whenever Nell was reporting about existence, like early this year before it was known he'd come back to G two, he actually used to say that part of existence's problem is that he was determined to stay in the French speaking scene. And actually, in the French speaking scene, loads of the players didn't want to play with him or thought he was outdated or you know like well that's something from the past. Like we're not going to consider that. But what he said was bizarre was because existence refused to like put in effort to do his English. He said it's the English speaking world where he's still highly revered because everyone just does think of the past and the great things he come. It's the same with Fallen. If these Brazilian players are sort of sick of the tune and what the record changed. The rest of us are the ones who still think, why can't he be the best in-game leader? So I agree. I think he'd get like a new lease of life in the FaZe Clan. And I said this before. If FaZe Clan think kicking Carrigan's a good move, like even if it's just for them, they think for us it's the right move. The second he gets released, 
there are so many in-game leaders in this world. When you consider he's been in Danish teams and international yeah. teams now to great acclaim, who are going to be doing that fucking meme of that kid where he's straining his neck. Yeah. There's going to be like snappy MSL, Chris J, go down the fucking. I'm good at doing memes, mate. I can do oh, it. That was fucking outrageous, mate. Go your down. Your vein was bigger than your neck. Yeah. I don't even know what that <laughs> Go down the list, and that so many of those people are feeling exactly like that. They're, they're arsehole. You could fucking. Oh, it's twitching like. Yeah. Unreal, isn't it? It's blinking like a fucking cyclops in a rainstorm. I mean, especially fucking. Uh, snappy, right? Especially because we all know that first six months were like, I, you know, all the stuff we've just been talking about, like all the problems they have in mouse sports now. Yeah, mate, that's exactly the sort of team like the old Fears clan that he joined, where you put him on that team, he quickly figure out who's fucking, who's capable, who's not, who do I need, who do I going to want to get rid of? What you got a little bit of money, but not too much, right? Get me this guy. They transform Wait, overnight, like me, Optic at North, all these teams. Let me tell you, who Carrigan is right. Carrigan is the good fucking Samaritan with, with a fucking twist, right? Like, I heard a story in the news about um, there was some uh, fucking person that found this homeless guy on the fucking streets where homeless people tend to be um, and basically oh, said, yeah, and basically fucking said, like, listen, um, you know, they, they had like some talent. I can't remember what the fuck it was. Uh, let's get you a, like a, a crowd raising, you know, fun charity nonsense thing, like one of them kickstarters they have money coming in brought them into their house you know help them get back on their feet and then the fucking homeless person like turned around and is trying to sue them <laughs> saying ah but you withheld some money from me and i didn't get all my dues my and all this my is life like this yeah it just is right you know we have that saying in english that is one of our idioms which goes no good deed goes unpunished yeah no it's true it's, it's true. true as well it's fucking true right so anyway that's carrigan that's who Carrigan is. He comes into your team. Yeah. He go, Let's get you back on your feet, Danes. Let's make... And then you go, yeah. you know what? I feel really confident now. I don't fucking yeah. need you. you go, yeah. I was doing that, motherfucker. Yeah. That was me. And then he goes, uh, you know, and then they're fucking blinging out of control. Well, you took me up the streets, Carrigan, and made me a multi-multi-millionaire. And Carrigan's like, yeah, it's brilliant, isn't it? We've succeeded together. Yeah, about that, mate. I've fucking got grills in my teeth now, so fuck you. And he's out the door, and then he's like, oh... Bloody hell, I'm never going to do that again. And then, ring, ring. All right, Faye's here. We've, we desperately need to get on our feet. We're, we're really fucking struggling. We're, all, we're sleeping on a bench. All right, then, sound, yeah. Couldn't happen to me twice, could it? So, you know, I feel massively sorry for Carrigan because there is no better in-game leader for, for the short-term fix than him in the world. None. And, as I said, as soon as he does go into free agency or benched or whatever, because I imagine it'll be benched because the Faye's sure. contracts are really long. Um, basically, like you say, everyone's got to be at panic stations because Optic can go out and get him tomorrow. Absolutely. Great relationships with FaZe. Definitely, the snappy experiment has been an unmitigated, like, I think the players would even thing. want it if they got the option, you know? Hey, can you imagine, right? Like, C Cajun B's another motherfucker who's lost his mojo. Carrigan's going to get him on his you know, back, back, sure. back to where he should be. Config, especially. Carrigan working with Config is such a fucking tantalizing prospect to me as a fucking fan of the game. Um, I I I'm completely on board with it. That's where you could get like top five player in the world, Config. Yeah, and, no, but and you know the player who really fucking needs it. Yugi, I have never seen a fucking Orpa go from being, holy shit, is this guy a top five Orpa in the world? To now, like, where it, it's like, it, oh, it's nice Stevie Wonder's having a go on fucking <laughs> Counter-Strike, isn't it? Still, use, still using him as the go-to blind man <laughs> until the better blind man comes along. Hey, it's ridiculous. Like, Nothing is... more ridiculous, though, than that thing where whenever you're playing and you get a flash and you're like, I'm over here playing Rich House. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that the name? Rich Al Simulator. Yeah, Rich Al Simulator, man. I'm so unreasonable, fucking, isn't it? I'm playing fucking Rich Al Simulator over it. We do need, we do need another blind celebrity, like yes. for sure. Like we, it, you time... say that, like go out there, kids, start throwing shit around, like. Yeah. Oh, we just, metaphorically, yeah. It's just time to move on from Stevie Wonder jokes, you know. Like it's just time. Like there's got to be somebody. There's got to be somebody out there who's fucking blind and cool and talented that you know, we can just start using. That's more contemporary. If anyone has any suggestions, I'm open to it. I'll try starting it. If I can make the Rat King stick, I can fucking overthrow Stevie Wonder as the go-to fucking blind guy. Uh, but anyway, you know, like Yugi looks fucking terrible. Yugi looks fucking terrible. 
and and he needs somebody who can infuse him with fucking confidence. And and that's what Carrigan does. He comes in, he brings you all around, and even though he's like a legendary in-game leader, it's all done by committee. He goes, well, what do you think? And you go, oh, my God, Carrigan's asking me what I think. Huh? And you start to grow a little bit. and you, ch- you know, he's done this for so many fucking players. Like, so Optic for me is a natural place. It's just whether Carrigan wants to fucking go there, yes. honestly. Because that's a fucking... If he can have his pick of the teams, I don't know if that's the first one you choose. No. But... I know fucking Hex, Hex would fucking... That's a fat salary. That's a big, fat fucking salary. Come come and help my CS team out. Um, so, I mean, and he is obviously a fucking economic student, right? In a, in a business mind. So it's definitely the most lucrative move on the table for him right now. But yeah, Carrigan could have his pick of the teams. But uh, what it does for FaZe, I don't know. Like him that's going the out- part that kills me as well. Because here's the thing. I, there's, there's a level on which I feel for the players. I understand why the expectation level should be so high. I understand that, you know what? I, I'll i even give them absolute... Uh, like, I'll co-sign the idea that some of the big breakdowns they did have, such as the major final against Cloud9, I do put some of that on Carrigan, quite frankly. I do think he did yeah. fail some of his job as an in-game leader. not so without get- flaws. Yeah. But my problem is... If they really believe that's the only problem, they are fucking delusional. Like, one of the things about their team that tilts me so much is because they have a a lineup that on paper looks like it is only people fragging, people always, I think, go too far in implying that, you know, no, but they do have really good roles set in the team, and, you know, people play it well. Like, I think they play some roles, and I think they have some elements that work well, but they so much of their game is just predicated upon fragging people. Like, anyone who looks at Astralis now and goes, it's the perfect team. If FaZe Clan tried to play like that, they'd be half as good as they are now. Like, they, they've basically oh, got, like, a sure. makeshift sure. lineup, and the flaw that they're not willing to accept is that they've gotten the most you can out of that. Like there's not there's no extra hidden fifth gear that they can go into with these four players and a different in-game leader that wins them anything for my money. Like I think what they've already done is still pretty fucking good. They won some championships, they had a lot of top fours. I think the move now is I mean, we mentioned this on past episodes, is you bring in a, a player that actually does something you need. You bring in a Crims or a, whoever it is, you get someone who's gonna start making you more of a real team. And then you know what? That is gonna mean saying to some of the other players. Now, we're not all having some fucking all-star super friends thing where it's like, well, I do this and I do this. It's like, yeah, one of you, you know what, Nico, now you do have to carry every game, mate. But the difference is you could win the tournament now. Yeah. And and just to kind of wrap it up, a uh, couple of things. So let's, let, I don't have any strong feelings about this, honestly. So I, I wasn't even going to bring it up, but I guess in the interest of completion, we've got to talk about it. Maybe you give a fuck. I, I, I really don't. Um, the whole Optic uh, North trade shit with like Gade, who you know, getting recalled back to North now that MSL's out. I imagine that's just as a temporary fill. Like, Gade is just getting passed around like a fucking party favor. And, you know, uh, Nico going to uh, Optic, um, I, I just don't really care. I, don't, <laughs> I just don't. I just don't think, I don't think any of these moves are permanent. I don't think any of the things fix any of the, any of the issues. Um, it just all seems like just something to do until the real lineups turn up you know agreed especially because the optic lineup to me it's like is that really the move that turns optic from like hard stock fucking 22nd best team in the world to top eight? i don't think so somehow that's not very reasonable like even even changing that player and upgrading them isn't yeah. going to fix the problems that config has and then snappy has. And then, you know, like, it's like there's too many issues down the line. That's why it would take like a Carrigan joining that team or some sort of a break up and reformulate the North and optic lineups. That's going to be the way to, to make some sort of headway there because I don't see that on either side being a good move. Yeah. It, it, they just feel like, like just temporary fucking fixes until the real shit starts to happen, you know? And then the last thing I wanted to talk about on the show, and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, was obviously your beloved G2, disappointing major, of course. Um, interesting move ahead. And now Carlos, you know, Ocelot, kind of intimated that there might be some shit going on, uh, that he was going to make some changes, but not like team changes, you know? And then, like, Niak um, has kind of uh, now moving back to a managerial role and won't be as hands-on with G2. And they're bringing in Malek, who you, I'm sure you remember from Envious. 
Now, we've talked about him on the show before. I'll tell you, I know him. I've known him a while. Uh, so full disclosure, I'm probably a little bit biased. But I, I thought he had one of the most fucking underappreciated jobs in all of Counter-Strike. I think he's an incredible coach. And unfortunately, the IGL he had to work with was fucking happy. Right? And I used to watch it all the time. NBA should be over there. Malik would go, oh, I've got all these notes and stuff. Yeah, I've been watching the demos all night happy. And he'd be going, yeah, but, you know, obviously when we play, I'm just going to send four people that way and bait everyone for kills. So kind of wasted your time a little bit there, didn't you, Malik? You know? And um, I just thought, like, what a fucking underappreciated fucking job he did. I thought he was, like, a great coach uh, who was basically hampered by the IGL he had to work with. Kind of weird situation because of all the people you would, of all the in-game leaders you would have thought, wouldn't be willing to work with a coach or would find it superfluous and a waste of time, it'd be existence. So I don't know what this move will, will achieve long term. And I, I kind of feel, uh, you know, I feel a bit sorry. I feel a bit sorry. thing is, uh, I'm with the move on the, on the grounds of, like I said, probably the most disappointing thing about G2's performance at the major was w- watching them play the maps that they'd played the most yeah. Dust 2, Inferno, and still not be like incredible on those. Be like good, but not amazing. And then realize, on oh, they don't actually have a full map pool. And that's why in every interview they're saying, yeah, we've got some of the maps, maybe four or so. It's like, what do you mean four? It's been like four or five months now or something, hasn't it? Like off the yeah. top of my head, whenever ECS was, that's going to be maximum four months ago. This should be time by now where you're already online. Like the, the, you know, I'm not saying it has to be 100, percent but fuck 60. It should be 80 percent by now. You've had boot camps, you've had full time with the five man lineup. You've even got players who've played together. It's not even like a brand new lineup entirely. Some of these players have a long tenure together, M- mad so, long tenure. So that does suggest to me, it's like I told you, it's one of the flaws of existence in the past. If bringing in a coach can help with that, if it's, if he's going to like lighten the load and you can focus on other areas where we need to level up now, okay. You can do that. I don't think it's going to fix the issues. I think they probably still are a player change away. But you know what? Uh, One of the things I've noticed with players is because they all want to believe it's going to work so much. Sometimes you have to do these small things. So it's like that can't be the new excuse. The excuse can't be, wow, we never tried having a coach. Right, you've got a coach now. Ah, but we need a boot camp. There's a boot camp. Ah, we haven't had enough events. Right, you've been to four events now. You know, it's like eventually there's no excuse. And then eventually at that point they have to say kick him instead of me. And you go, finally, you yeah. come around to my way of thinking. Now let's get this guy the fuck out of here. Welcome, Flusher, to G2. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it, it just it just seems like really strange because uh, I, I, Malik isn't, uh, he understands the game on a, on, a, on a deep level. No doubt about that. Does he understand it on as deep a level as existence? Don't know. Probably not. Right? If existence is one of the great thinkers of our time, so that wasn't the issue. So what's he there for? Is it conflict resolution? Well, this team certainly shouldn't be having conflict because all of you got everything you wanted from the moment you hoodwinked Carlos into thinking this was a good fucking idea and that he shouldn't have gone with the MBK Apex team, which would have been infinitely better than this. So I do not know. Like, I, I don't know why he's there. I, it feels like it's like, Carlos is saying, look, we've got to make some changes, and I also need to be seen to make some yes. changes for the fans. Yes, that's a way, as an org, you can offset people calling for one of your players to be cut. You bring yeah. in a coach, now we're going to try something different now. Yeah. And and, and he, he did it before, right? When Smith was the coach, if I remember. Is that right? Uh, Car- I think, did he? Yeah. Um, Car- didn't, wasn't it Carlos' decision to allow Smith to coach or something? I can't fucking remember. There's been so many fucking tumultuous changes in fucking G2. It's hard to fucking keep up with it all. But um, look, I, I don't know if this fixes the problems long term. I don't think that five can work. I think next on the chopping block, because Smith is invincible, is going to be body. I think if you can go out and get a top French player, fine. But this new French lineup that's being rumored, which I guess we should, we can, yeah, we've still got a little bit of time, so we may as well talk about that, um, is it looks a much better team to me. Like, I'm more excited about that, even with Happy returning and not being an IGL. Um, so that's going to be the uh, Vitality team, is what people are saying. Um, and yeah, the, we, we alluded to it on the last episode uh, of, of what the rumored lineup was, but now it's sort of been reported in, um, you know, by DK and HLTV. Oh, sorry, by Nell, I should say, rather. Don't want to miss attributes. Uh, it was published on BP Esports. Uh, so uh, it's MBK, Apex, Happy, RPK, and Zwu. Now, I'm excited about that. Without wanting to go to GB James, that gets my dick hard. 
I'm, I'm thinking about that team being fucking really, really good, really exciting to watch. Everything I associate with um, with French Counter Strike, and again, happy apparently just being a, a player. They've got a coach all lined up, a guy called Faculty, uh, who, if you uh, remember, was played back in 1.6, uh, and apparently is is also a published writer um, about esports and has studied coaching in football. So I'm also excited about that. It sounds like a real coach, a guy who left the game, went away, studied how they do sports coaching, and is now coming back to esports with this great lineup. I think this is going to blow fucking G2 out the water. This, to me, should have been the G2 team. But what do you think of this roster? I mean, it's sure there's a lot of question marks around it, but I'm but I am excited by this. Like the talent of the roster is very good. The main issue for me, yeah, is the in-game leader aspect. Like I still don't know how that resolves itself, how that works out. Like that's that's the big flaw to me. So yeah. I definitely like obviously you want to see what Zui does when he's got good players. Some of the players in the team already are some of my favorites. Ones I enjoy. I even would actually like to see Happy just be an in game, just be a player in game and not be well, the in game so, leader. Yeah, but that's what I thought was happening. I I, I didn't know. Oh, if it Happy is. Was. But, but I'm saying yeah. I want to see it actually happen. Yeah, yeah, Because yeah, when, yeah. when they did it in Envious two years ago, like they didn't do it properly because since they did it in a scenario where it's like he wasn't going to be kicked. I've said this before, and basically it aligns with what is my understanding. He basically just did, like, had a fucking tantrum and was just yeah. like, right, well, I'll ruin the whole game then if I can't be the in-game leader. And it's like that sort of thing where it's like, when he was then lurking, you know, and then didn't do anything, it's like, well, well I'm not the in-game leader, so how could I know that you were going to be there? It's yeah. like, fuck, fuck off, mate, just leave already. But sadly, they never had the heart to do that because one of the things about, I mean, to be fair, this is one of the reasons why a lot of the names we're mentioning in this Sure, so far, are getting mad like extra life out of their name is whatever your highest tight is, that's still ingrained in people's brain. So, in, in people's brain, they were still like, God's oh, happy though, he's the one who won all those majors, isn't he? He was the one with all. So, if so, if he if he's right, if he does come back, we don't want to piss him off and kick him, do we? Which is like, actually, that should not have been your concern, but I get why it's a player's way of thinking about the game, you know? Yeah. Uh, and, and again, I mean, like, finally, we're going to get to see the emergence of this uh, potential young superstar in the form of Zewu, who uh, I think, again, just to show that we don't uh, always fucking put down the young talent as, as it's all. I, I cannot wait to see him on a pro team with seasoned professionals backing him up. DK made the point in the chat as well that when he was at the major, every team, every player he spoke to um, said uh, basically that, you know, and it's scrims. So, yes. Doesn't mean they got anything. mad hype about them, but but everybody says these the this team is banging people the fuck out in scrims. Now listen, I've heard that about like you know fucking absolutely terrible teams. That's in the past why, by the way, you know what? Joke. I'm going to use this as a one brief moment to call someone out. Always, like, I am so bored of people. It's in line with the fishiest do type person, where again, it's just attention whoring, where what you do is you go, hey, I've got a secret. It's not even your secret. You're not involved in any way, and you're yeah. only using hearsay of what someone told you. So in the same vein, I think Nell said some sort of a tweet along the lines of like, he was like super excited for this lineup, or it's going to be amazing. I think he might have even said they'd be immediately top 10, right? That's not any sort of genius analysis. It's not some extra information he knows that the rest of us doesn't. He's just heard like everyone else. Else, that in scrims they're wrecking everyone and he's gone ah uh, you know what my hot tip is just some stuff that everyone i know has told me sound like what's that that's nothing you don't get any credit for that what are you the fucking wall that the sound echoed off in the <laughs> grand canyon <laughs> hello, hello 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 you hear me i was saying hello there you weren't your daft cut you're a wall <laughs> anyway i've got triggered at the end so. yeah yeah triggered at the end <laughs> triggered at the end the new series with uh duke authority shield um but yeah, so look, I, I'm I'm super excited about that team, um, and I and I think G2 is like again very much like that meme. They're going to be looking over. I, I don't even understand where this vitality org have got this fucking money from. I mean, that's he another. Shocks is going to be there. He's got Smiths next to him, who's looking at him like, and he's just looking back over it like fucking Zwei or something, going looking back over my shoulder. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, but I mean, this is this to me is like listen. Shocks was playing lights out at the fucking major. Every, everyone else, not so much. Um, uh, this is just such a, a more well-rounded team. And the terrifying prospect is you got the fucking great young French star playing alongside, you know, MBK, the linchpin of any team. Imagine a world where, the, fuck happy for fucking two seconds, right? Imagine a world where Apex gets back to where we know he can be as a fucking a world-class entry fragger and RPK plays like how he was playing before he got pneumonia. Fuck me, this team's insane. 
th- this team would literally be insane. I mean, it's not again, like you say, it's not any great analysis, but yeah, I think this team does go straight into the, the especially the current top ten. You know, if a terrible mouse sports is clinging on, you know, th- this team has got real fucking potential, and G two are going to be looking over at this and saying, "This is uh, this is the one that got away." I think. So. One thing that does tilt me though is where the fuck is Kiyoshima? I, I mean, come on, dog. You know, like, right, one of the things I love about all fucking horse face killer Kiyoshima, right, one of the things I love about that motherfucker is, like, he does not fucking hide away from fucking burning bridges at all. That's mad, isn't it? Right? <laughs> never, never gives um, a fuck about any of that bullshit, right? So, he's never, mate, he's never going to play in another top French lineup. How many bridges? There's no bridges. There's, he's like a Makalela character now. Like, it's just, well, going to be playing on international lineups for the rest of my career. He's a fucking great player. Um, he's very good at what he does. Um, but yeah, he needs to be looking over at a fucking an in, international lineup. So yeah, where the fuck is Kiyoshima? Definitely not bound to, ev- to ever play again in any team in France. Welcome to the Imperial Kiyoshima. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, mate, I don't think it'd get that bad for him. Like, fucking hell, I wouldn't wish that on anyone. All you're right, man, you're, off. Yeah. <laughs> you know? There's something to be said. Like, he would, he would do a fucking good job in a lot of fucking teams that are out there right now. Uh, and if there weren't language barriers... I mean, like, again, Kishim is another switched on cat. He was another one of the French players who said, listen, French is great and all that, but maybe we should learn this English language I've been hearing so fucking much about. Seems to be one that's, like, pretty popular right now. Seems to be, like, it increases your chance of getting jobs and that if you can speak it. So maybe we should get on board with that. And he did. And a lot of French people went, no, zut allo, he's I mean, learn this. And he said it in English because I can't speak You know, speak that's the French. worst thing as well, is that, like, the idea you need to sell French players on learning English so, because you know, one of the reasons this is this is how mad fr- French players are and how disconnected they are from reality. One yeah. of the reasons they've given me in the past is they go, "Yes, but my accent is too strong." Yeah, you know, like it, it, it's 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 weird. It's weird, like being worried about the accent. I I agree. I think the French accent. You know, it's people strong. like accents, don't they? Yeah, people like accents. But anyway, so um, I, I think we can sort of fucking wrap the show up there. I'll let you go back. So you're doing ESL New York. It's weird because obviously you don't get invited to events. So I mean, what, you just gate crashing it or? Something like that, isn't it? Yeah, I don't know. Like, like the fucking funeral crash. Here's the thing. Something. I'm in the ideal scenario. It's yeah. like there was once a great quote. I, I forget who it was, but it was like an RTS player who said, in an ideal world, I'd lose every single practice game and win every official match. Because yeah. that really would be like the best way to learn, you know, most efficient use of your time. It's the same thing. I, I'm very happy being completely irrelevant and not getting hired for any events. But at the end of the year, my accountant going, yep, yeah, numbers are working out like a motherfucker. Yeah, I mean. Ideal scenario, really. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, and I'm not going to ask you like, any predictions or anything we'll just talk about the fucking event afterwards this one's but, pretty wide open so uh, yeah it'll be interesting especially after the major i think there's a lot of interesting shit so uh the next uh, episode of the show which could even be done with both of us live in vegas yes it's yeah. all possible could well be done um it will be interesting but sam it now means that uh, it's time to well, do time for the big scroll yeah time for the big the big scroll uh, so anyway, uh, yeah, just a shout out, obviously, to everybody who tuned in and watched the stream or liked and subscribed and all of that. Thank you very much. Shout out to Rivalry.gg. Remember, you can go to Rivalry.gg slash RLS, get $350 worth of bonuses. Uh, you can ask them questions about, you know, whether they're expanding to your region or not. You know, get in there, support the channel, support the content, support Rivalry.gg. They're uh, an ethical company offering esports betting in the space, a very rare beast indeed. And, of course, thanks to our patrons. Here is the list, the big scroll, as uh, Sam calls it. $100 patrons, Botvik, Chris and Wynn, Detlef Insomniac, Yolu, and Jerky's Minion are $50 patrons. Uh, Manuel Stockley, I got it right this time. It's not Mowell Stockley, even though that typo is still there. Saad Sawar. Yeah, yeah, I'm on, mate. I'm on, I'm on point today. Like, I'm on point. I've had no fucking sleep. I've got that edgy energy, right? I actually read shit. Uh, Daniel Plamenov, Yordanov, Pete Bidstrup, Ivan Candido, TC Owens, Carv Rusty, Ditter Dornhoff Christensen, Nastradamus, Marcus Kiumpa, Madsen, Oli Ginter Zillin, Colin Penny, Benakagi Assassin, and William Southern. Shout out to all of you guys. Shout out to Duncan. Have a good time at the SL1 New York. I'll be watching. And to all of you, uh, we'll be back on the next episode of By the Numbers, whenever the fuck that's going to be. We'll let you know. Stay tuned to Twitter. And until then, take care of yourselves. Peace.